Hello everyone. Welcome to the Fall 2021 Shakespeare Oxford Fellowship Annual Conference. My name is Cheryl Egan Donovan. I'm a filmmaker, an educator, and a proud member of the Shakespeare Oxford Fellowship. Today we'll hear from some of the leading scholars and writers in the field of Shakespeare authorship research, and I'll do a brief introduction for each speaker. The complete abstracts and bios for all of the presenters can be found on our website conference page at shakespeareoxfordfellowship.org. Uh, in the interest of time, we have a very tight schedule today, we will use the Q&A function for questions, and at the end of each pre presentation, if there is time, I'll pose a few questions to the presenters, but they have generously offered to respond to your questions after the conference if we don't have time to get to them during the presentations. Uh, our sponsored activities at the SOF include publications such as the quarterly Shakespeare Oxford newsletter, the annual peer-reviewed journal The Oxfordian, and the Brief Chronicle book series. Uh, we also have an award-winning podcast series, Don't Quill the Messenger, and the annual Who Wrote Shakespeare video contest. Uh, we do annual membership meetings, and conferences, symposia, we give research grants, and we have a National Speakers Bureau. Uh, and don't forget to visit our website where you can find news items, articles, links to other authorship websites, films, videos, and publications. We're now three weeks into our annual fundraising drive, during which we ask you to help finance the work of our fellowship. We are a 501c3 nonprofit organization which means your cash donations may be tax deductible to the extent allowed by law. But we're not just nonprofit. We are also actively working for change. One of our primary goals is to inspire and convince the academic status quo to adopt the authorship question as a valid course of study. This year's fundraising drive is enhanced by some intriguing thank you gifts for our donors, including the 2021 edition of the Oxfordian, as well as a limited quantity of out-of-print books and artwork focused on the 17th Earl of Oxford, generously donated by our members. Please help support our mission by visiting the SOF website, shakespeareoxfordfellowship.org, clicking the donate button and giving. Thank you. Our first speaker today is Ben August. Ben became an active supporter of Oxfordian activities after reading Mark Anderson's book, Shakespeare by Another Name. Thereafter, he removed the traditional Shakespeare bus from his library shelf. Not able to find uh, a, a bust of Edward de Vere, he commissioned one by the sculptor Paula Slater, and one, an original now is at Kessel Headingham in England. Ben, an associate producer of the documentary film Nothing is Truer Than Truth, also produces a premium Cabernet and Merlot from the August family vineyards under his Earl 17 label. He serves on the SOF Board of Trustees on the Membership, Fundraising, Finance, and Video Contest Committees. Welcome, Ben. Thank you, Cheryl, and hello, everyone. Um, as an introduction to Earl's talk, uh, I'll tell you a little bit about how I acquired uh, the 1565 edition of Herodotus um, and talk about how it could affect our organization in the future. I'm not qualified to talk about the details of how it may have served as a source book for Shakespeare. So I'll be happy to leave that to Earl and the experts. But uh, first about the book, it's a 1565 uh, translation of Herodotus uh, of the Greek uh, history of the Greek and Persian wars by Matteo Maria Boyorda. He was born in 1440 and lived to 1494 and is considered the first major narrative poet of the early Renaissance, Italian Renaissance. He completed the translation about 1490 and there were five editions published between 1533 and 1565. This final edition was published in Venice in 1565 and are morally bound, has put a bore on it, uh, for Oxford. Records show that De Vere spent 1565 carnival in Venice and there are, and was there until late in the year of 1565. So the timing 
is perfect. And there's really no controversy about whether this was bound for him. So how, how did I come to own the book? Well, in May of 2019, when we were alerted to the book going to auction, members quickly organized an SOF campaign to raise the necessary funds to acquire it. The group led by Don Rubin cobbled together about $12,000, I think. And uh, we felt that was gonna be enough to cover the purchase because that was the indication from the auction house. They estimated it would go for nine to $12,000. So it's, it's interesting because there are many other editions of this same book, obviously not found for Oxford, but the same edition from 1565 that are in several li or libraries, universities, and private collections, but their, their value is nowhere near even the 7,000, 8,000, 9,000 that was estimated it would be sold for on auction. Um, in fact, last week I found one that was available for 620 euros. And in uh, 2015, this exact volume sold for about $7,000. So the question is, how did I come to open, to, to own this book? Well, uh, aside from the obvious, you know, what, is it, what does it mean that uh, I spent $60,000 for this book? Well, uh, it's a good question. Uh, in my defense, uh, I wanna talk about investment value for a minute. And, and I'll, I'll tell you, I didn't think of this during the auction or uh, uh, beforehand. It was really trying to figure out afterwards when I owned it, uh, how I could possibly have paid uh, 60,000 for it. And, and really, what it was is during the, the 60 to 90 seconds, uh, this intense auction process, I just couldn't accept the idea of you know, these uh, stodgy old men uh, smugly you know, tucking it away in some vault somewhere and, and keeping it away from uh, the eyes of the people who want to examine it and who believe that it was owned by Shakespeare. So whether this edition sold for 12,000 or 60,000, it's extraordinary value. This particular volume only can be because it was owned by Shakespeare. Um, that's what makes it as, as valuable as it, as it is. When you, when you hold this book um, and you think about it being held by Shakespeare, um, it, it gives you, I mean, it, it sends you back in time and uh, it, it just gives you a feeling of, of you know, seriousness and, and importance and depth. And uh, that unique feeling, I think, is what people look for when they visit you know, places that celebrities or famous people have visited. Um, and they pay enormous sums for autographs, for instance. So I decided to check on the value of some autographs of important people in history. And to do that, I referred to this book. This is the book that actually first alerted me to Edward de Vere being Shakespeare. It's um, titled, it's Michael Hart's The 100. And in this book, Michael Hart ranks the, what he considers the 100 most influential persons in history. And he has brief explanations for his rationale along with a brief uh, biography on the person. So Edward de Vere, Shakespeare, is number 31 in this book, the 31st most influential person in history. So I was curious when thinking about the value of this book, you know, what is the value of other uh, autographs of other people from the 100 most influential people? 
So to give you an idea, I found a financial document signed by Isaac Newton that sold for 23,750. And you can find Adam Smith for about 100,000, Rene Descartes for about 150,000, Beethoven for 140,000. For Galileo, bidding starts at a million. Then I looked up Shakespeare. And sure enough, I found that Shakespeare's autograph is one of the rarest autographs. And uh, this is an article I found. In, in this article, it says uh, the world's rarest autograph. And uh, it, goes, it goes into some detail. Let me, uh, I'll go into that in just a minute. Uh, the, the idea of, of Shakespeare's autograph being the rarest, of course, as we all know, there are only six of them. And uh, this article actually uh, could be a little description of why we should be doubting the Shakespeare authorship. It, it says, uh, it is one of the more devastating twists of history that all of Shakespeare's written manuscripts were lost long ago. Should the text for Romeo and Juliet, or as you like it, ever turn up, its value would be inestimable. Uh, you might expect the greatest writer ever to have lived to have excellent handwriting, and it points out that, of course, he didn't. Uh, another quote from this article says, some of the, uh, Shakespeare writes in a peculiarly wobbly hand and writes his name differently each time. Shakespeare, it was quite, he, he, he writes his, he spells it six different ways. It was quite common to abbreviate your name. It was not quite common to abbreviate your name the way he did. So anyway, Shakespeare's autograph is amongst or the rarest in the world. So if we look inside this book in just inside the title page here, it, it may not be easily seen from there, but there's an inscription. It says in Latin to Berkeley, a gift from the illustrious Edward Earl of Oxford. So here we have what we believe is Shakespeare's autograph. We're all working in our own way to have Edward de Vere recognized in Shakespeare as Shakespeare. And I think that's really the, the purpose, the primary purpose of our organization. I, I still remember um, reading or watching the Frontline documentary with Charlton Osborne and something touched me very deeply about how, how badly he wanted Edward de Vere to be recognized as Shakespeare and, and just how desperately he was willing to uh, work for that. He, he really understood that Edward de Vere deserves to be recognized as Shakespeare. Now that, that Looney and Ogburn and so many others have passed on, this becomes our job. And the value of this book can become a bellwether of how well we're doing. There's no guarantee that this volume will continue to grow in value. It could be worth 7,000 again and so at some point in the future. And in my opinion, if we're not building value in the book, then we're, we're losing value in the book. Or if we're not building momentum toward Edward de Vere being recognized as Shakespeare, then we're losing that momentum. So this year I'm, I'm co-chairing the, the fundraising and membership committee with Heidi Janish, and we're both committed to having a successful year. And that means we've got to make meaningful progress toward getting Oxford recognized as Shakespeare. For that, we'll need to capture people's attention and their imagination and come up with exciting projects that will help people to believe Edward de Vere as Shakespeare, understand the mountain of evidence behind that. And as for the future of this book, 
I'd really like to see this book in the hands of the fellowship, donated and worth a million dollars. And I believe that is the future of this book if we do our job right. That's where I believe it belongs and what Oxford deserves. Thank you. Thanks so much, Ben. Fascinating talk. And thank you again for uh, making the effort to acquire that book. Uh, there was a question in the chat regarding whether or not there were any plans to digitize the book and if there were any other um, annotations in the book. There, there are no annotations uh, in the book beyond the, some names on the, the cover or the inside cover. Um, so there aren't any notes. Uh, and as far as digitizing it, I would be glad to uh, offer it up to anybody who is qualified to do that properly and make sure it's, it's well preserved. Great. Very exciting. Thank you again for that introduction. And next we'll hear from Dr. Earl Showerman. Uh, Earl Showerman, MD, is a graduate of Harvard University and the University of Michigan Medical School. He practiced emergency medicine in Oregon for over 30 years, a longtime patron of the Shakespeare Oregon, Oregon Shakespeare Festival. Um, Earl uh, retired, after he retired, he enrolled in Southern Oregon University to study Shakespeare and research the authorship question. He now teaches adult ed learning courses at Southern Oregon University on the topic. And over the past 15 years, he has regularly presented at SOF conferences and published on the topic of Shakespeare's Greek dramatic sources. Um, he's also contributed a chapter on Shakespeare's medical knowledge to the 2013 book, Shakespeare Beyond Doubt, Exposing an Industry in Denial. An associate of the UK's Shakespeare Authorship Trust, he's a former president of the Shakespeare Fellowship, one of the SOF's predecessor organizations. Earl's presentation today is Classical Mythopoetic Profusion in the Lamentable Tragedy of Titus Andronicus. Welcome, Earl. Thank you very much, Cheryl. And thank you, Ben, for your generous contributions in recent years in promoting uh, the authorship question in the, in the case for Edward de Beer. Incidentally, I want to recommend uh, Earl 17 Wines. They're outstanding. So any of you are interested in that, you should reach out to Ben or make a contribution and receive the benefit of that. Um, and in his purchase of the Herodotus that prompts me to give a talk on Titus Andronicus, a drama I've never actually seen staged, despite the fact that it was performed at the festival here 20 years ago, um, partly because of my aversion to violence as an emergency physician. I'd seen the consequences of it frequently enough that I didn't really want to feel uh, obliged to go see a, 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 a play that indulged in, in, in that aspect. Uh, I've had hair-raising experiences in the, in the theater when it was very dramatically powerful and, and suffered migraines afterwards for the violence. So. I'm admitting that I've never seen the play live, but there are some excellent videos that I will share with you uh, uh, recommendations. Now, the plot of Titus Andronicus is probably unfamiliar to many of you. It's fictional. It's based on a series of fabulous and historical Greek and Roman exemplars colored by scenes of bitter black comedy. The resultant violence, murder, mutilation, it's all subversively stunning and unrelenting, actually escalating toward the end of the play. Uh, in the first act, Titus's eldest son, who, Titus has just returned from warring with the Goths, with bringing his Gothic prisoners with him. His eldest son, Lucius, marches off Tamara's eldest son, Alarvus, to lop off his links to mollify the ghosts and decorate the tomb of Titus's 21 dead sons, all victims uh, from the war with the Goths. Uh, Titus had already sacrificed the noblest of the uh, Goths in a ritual that's described by Marcus. Uh, now we want to have additional sacrifice, sacrifices. Uh, later, Titus kills his own son, Meutius, for his protection of Lavinia and Bassianus, her betrothed. And then in act two, Tamara's surviving sons, Demetrius and Chiron, murder Bassianus, uh, the new emperor Saturninus's brother, and then participate in framing Titus's two sons, Martius and Quintus, for the crime. The offstage rape and mutilation of Lavinia marks an escalation in gruesomeness. In Act Three, the competition for the hand chopped off to ransom the lives of Titus's sons 
who have now been condemned for murder is rewarded with the return of their heads and Titus's hand. In Act 4, the nurse who, uh, who uh, pre was present during uh, Tamara's birth giving is stabbed on stage. The midwife will certainly be dispatched. In the following scene, a clown is condemned to death for simply delivering a message to the emperor. Now, in the final act, it really escalates. Tamara's sons, their throats slid on stage, are chopped off off stage into a cannibalistic meat pie uh, to be served to uh, Emperor Saturninus and, and Tamara. Uh, Lavinia is then killed by her father, who uses Livy to justify the murder. Then Titus kills Tamara. Then Saturninus kills Titus. And then Lucius, the future emperor, kills Saturninus in revenge for the killing of his own father. Uh, you know, the heap of horrors reflect a vengeful passions sustained to artifice and the, represents the absurd. Now the crime scene totals include 15 corpses, a larvus's lopped whim, limbs, two heads, three hands, a tongue, and you know, wonderful revenge comedy. Well, very popular apparently in its date. So I'm gonna launch into my uh, screen sharing here with you and we'll get going on the rest of the uh, presentation. So that's a summary of the plot for you. So the title of my talk is Classical Middle Mythopoetic Profusion and the Most Lamentable Roman Tragedy of Tritus Andronicus, and that is the title of the first quarto. It's as early tragedy of blood or tragedy of horror, you might say. Now, uh, this is an image of uh, Plato's Symposium, uh, and I suspect that this were uh, to be performed during uh, Titus's era, the, 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 the chalice there with the wine in it would probably be contaminated with blood. Now, uh, there are several videos of this uh, production of this play that I think are worth, worth recommending. Uh, Julie Tamor, the creator of The Lion King, uh, apparently was, had some success in taming the wilderness of tigers that is the, the scene in Titus. Uh, I was averse to looking at this video, but in fact, I think it's excellently well done. It's uh, really surreal in so many regards, but it doesn't lose dramatic significance. And Anthony Hopkins as Titus and Jessica Lang as Tamara are, are compelling. They're very quite compelling. However, I do recommend another version of this play that was uh, uh, performed about six years ago at Shakespeare's Globe Theater. Um, and uh, was, I think, an outstanding production of this play and it really coheres and, and, and uh, I believe it's, it's a superior uh, production and, and done in the style that you would have seen on Elizabethan stage, the way it's done at the Globe Theater in London, the New Globe. Uh, these are some images from previous productions of Timus. This is again a globe production of Timus. You see Tamara there in chains with Titus with the great plume of his conceit uh, waving in the air. Uh, another image here is, is taken from that uh, another uh, production. You see uh, once again, although it's not in the stage direction that the, uh, the Goths are all uh, 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 portrayed in, in chains, there's Lavinia, uh, the innocent Lavinia standing in the background watching this. This is the scene in which Larbus is about to be taken off. And you can see a very butch Tamara there, uh, very, very disconcerted by the situation they're in. Now, here's another image from the Glow production of Tamara pleading for mercy for, uh, from Titus to save her son Alarbus who's about to be taken off. And it's a beautiful speech. Uh, it's, it's like uh, Portia's speech for uh, the you know, quality of mercy is not strained. It's an excellent uh, a plea, but Titus of course ignores that, which is his first big mistake. Uh, and uh, Alarbus is then taken off and uh, created a, a situation that really is a impious scene where the blood from the dismembered Alarbus is spread across the, the tomb of, of, of the Andronici. Now here's another image from that Globe production that is compelling, which is showing Lavinia with both her hands chopped off and her tongues cut off with Titus there as he plots and decides with her how best to revenge themselves upon Tamara and her children. And Aaron, and here's a scene where the throats of, the, of Demetrius and Chiron are slit and collected in a basin by, by, by Lavinia. The blood is then combined with the ground bones of these and the meat from their flesh and served to Saturninus and, and uh, Tamar for the delectation in his special banquet in Act Five. I do recommend Jonathan Bates' uh, edition and uh, Arden edition of Titus Andronicus. It's, it's very well done. 
He originally did this in 1995. And in that edition, he said, there's no reason to think that this was co-authored by any other. It's, it, there, there's, a, there's a structural integrity uh, about this play that uh, would speak against the possibility of, of co-authorship. And besides that, imitation certainly was, was actively engaged in by, by uh, playwrights at that time. And yet in this 2018 edition, he has a 40 page addendum in there in which he reviews the scholarship of people like Dover Wilson, McDonald Jackson and Brian Vickers, claiming that the whole first act and scene was written by George Peel, who was classically trained, of course. Um, I have a problem with that because I don't believe there's any change in the theme and the language or anything like that. Besides that, you give to Peel the great speeches of Tamara and Aaron, perhaps the first great soliloquy of one of Shakespeare's uh, uh, villains. So I disagree with the interpretation. To me, the language, the poetry, the uh, scene, the allusions, they all fit as a, as a dramatic theme that works throughout the play. So I, I would argue against co-authorship in that regard, but he seems to have been converted by the recent uh, 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 research by others, including the Oxford University. Now, this is a, an image of the front, front page of the title page of the first edition. You look at this as it was played by the Right Honorable Earl of Derby, Earl of Pembroke and Earl of Sussex, their servants. Now this is in 1594. This is the year before the Earl of Oxford's daughter will marry the Earl of Derby, okay? And then that his middle daughter, Bridget, is being negotiated to, to, for the marriage of the Earl of Pembroke contemporaneous with this. So I wonder if that has anything to do with why Oxford would be a credible uh, candidate for authorship of this, of this play. First published, the first Shakespeare play ever published. Uh, and this is the first Shakespeare play, we have a de definite date of its first performance, 1594. Now this is an illustration. This is also the first and only illustration we have of a dramatic uh, production of Shakespeare. This is by Henry Peacham. It was discovered by John Payne Collier. So its provenance is somewhat questionable, but uh, here is uh, Tamara pleading for the life of her son, Alarbus, to Titus dressed in a, uh, a typical Roman toga, whereas his guards with him is, is, are dressed like uh, English, uh, 16th century uh, uh, you know, uh, guards. Now there's Aaron with the sword held over the heads of uh, uh, Mutius and Quintus, I mean, sorry, uh, Quintus and, and his other brother. So this is this represents. I'll see you the show you the whole script from the uh, document that uh, Collier came up with, which shows the speech of of Tamara wishing uh, you know for the mercy on her son, and then the, and the last part of it is the speech of Aaron. Uh, so his soliloquy is included in this piece. So both of those speeches were considered to be important by Henry Peacham at that time. The date of this is uncertain, but it's probably in the early 16th century. Now, what is the date of composition? Well, if you believe uh, uh, Ben Johnson's uh, 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 induction uh, during Bartholomew Fair in 1614, it was probably dated sometime around uh, 1586 to 1591, somewhere in that range. And most scholars assume that it was written sometime between 1591 and 93. Uh, and consider the fact that the Ovidian influence is so powerful in this. And so it, it's contemporaneous with the publications also of Venus and Adonis and the Rape of Lucrece. Now, early 20th century criticism was very, very negative on, on this. Uh, T.S. Eliot, who was himself a, a classic scholar and published uh, the 10 tragedies of Seneca, to call it one of the stupidest and uninspired plays ever written. And Dover Wilson, who saw a lot of parallels with George Peel's language in the act one says that the whole play is a huge joke in which Shakespeare watched the groundlings gaping ever wider and swallowed more and more as he tossed them bigger and bigger gobbets of sob stuff and raw beefsteak. Not exactly your, your uh, uh, great reviews. Now, Jonathan Bate hits the nail on the head when he talks about the fact, when he, in his edition, mentions that it's one of the dramatist's most inventive plays, a complex self-conscious improvisation upon classical sources most notably the Metamorphoses of Ovid, which appears on stage as a prop during act three. Uh, so, and he says that uh, uh, Titus is the play in which uh, it's been beautified by the feathers of classicism uh, and, to a, and with a vengeance, he also says that. Now, Tanya Pollard, whose book, uh, Greek Tragic uh, uh, Women on Shakespearean Stages, uh, has a lot to say about Titus Andronicus. And she says this, and I think this is a very concise description of what happens here. The layering of Roman literary models on Greek ghosts to form new English originals, the place 
Palimpsests reveal crucial debts to unfamiliar origins. And those origins are Greek history and Greek drama. Now, Jane Grogan, whose article I'm gonna be really digging into here a bit, wrote an article called Headless Rome and Hungry Goths, Herodotus and Shakespeare and Titus Andronicus. And it's an outstanding article. Any of you interested in this, I will be sure you can get the PDF of it. She says here, and I think this really gives us the greatest description of what the uh, dramatic uh, concept of this. The play repeatedly and ostentatiously invites the viewer and readers to make sense of its plots and moral codes by reference to other texts, just as its protagonists do to try to make sense of their own situations. There are more classical quotations and classical allusions in this play per line than any other play in Shakespeare, including Hamlet, which is loaded. More often than not, the play invokes the well-worn classical text of the early modern schoolroom and the homosexual communities of the universities and inns of court. Virgil, Horace, Ovid, Seneca, Livy, and a host of Roman historians and lawyers. And the spirit in which such texts are invoked is usually mock scholarly, sometimes brutally so. It shows the subtlety of the interpretation there that the, oftentimes the quotes are, are meant to be interpreted ironically from what the character is actually expressing. The Latin classical sources are obvious. Ovid, and, and I will have some further things to say about that, but Metamorphoses impacts this hugely uh, and is perhaps the most important literary source for this text. Seneca's tragedies, uh, Thyestes, uh, is probably the scene for the, th the theme of cannibalism in which you feed your enemies' children to them, which is what Titus does to Tamara and Saturninus in the end. And also there's two direct quotes from the Hippolytus. It, uh, one of them is a misquote actually. Virgil's Aeneid has impact on this. Uh, uh, and Horace's ecologues are quoted directly in the text. Terence is Andrea. Terence was of course a slave from North Africa uh, and brought to, brought to Rome and then became a famous playwright uh, perhaps putting his name on other people's works. But in all likelihood, he was black. You know, he was probably of North African descent. Uh, so he may be, you know, the fact that his, his comedy, Andrea, it's a very dark comedy, has certain uh, dramatic parallels to the text of, of Titus. And it may be the author's way of tipping his hat toward Aaron as a very clever writer. I mean, Aaron is, is a master. He's, he's like a prototype for Iago. Uh, his plotting and his conniving and his unrepentant evil is, un, is, is, unremar is quite remarkable. Uh, Titus Livius, uh, Livy is quoted uh, toward the end of the play, but is a source of several of the, of the narratives within the play, including Saturninus and, and Blasianus. And uh, Justinus is Trogus Pompeius, the abridged Trogus. Now, this was a work that Arthur Golding translated in 1564 and dedicated to his 14-year-old nephew, the Earl of Oxford, which I will have more to say in a few minutes here. Now, Stephen Sable, who also has provoked me into uh, investigating this, says there's a lot of Greek in here. What do you think? Well, I said, well, I'll glad to look at it. So clearly, Ben's purchase of the Herodotus uh, it, it encouraged me to do some further investigation. And certainly book one of Herodotus histories is very, very impactful on several elements of the plot. Plutarch's uh, parallel lies, many of the names of the characters come from Plutarch. Uh, Herodian's uh, history of the Roman Empire. He was Greek, writing in Greek, but it's a history of the Roman Empire. And it's from his text that the conflict between Saturninus and Bassianus to see who would become the emperor is based upon. Heliodorus's Ethiopica, dedicated to the Earl of Oxford in 1569, also a literary source, probably because the Ethiopian, the, the black Ethiopian queen, okay, has a fair-skinned child. Um, and she is terrified that this will end her reign as queen. And so she has it sent off with the shepherd to, to be exposed. Of course, the shepherd takes mercy on her and the, 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 the child, Chair Clara, is fed by, you know, by miraculously survives and then later comes back and is acknowledged as the daughter of the king and queen of Ethiopia. But so the threat of a mixed race child is mixed, is, is comes from Heliodorus, which is introduced toward the end of, of Titus Andronicus as Aaron takes his son uh, away and then is captured uh, by Lucius and the Goths. Euripides Hecuba plays a big role in terms of our identification uh, with Tamara with female grief over the murder of their child. And uh, Tanya Pollard has a lot to say about that. Sophocles' Ajax, the discourse between uh, Laertes' son, uh, Odysseus, and the other Greeks in terms of burial rituals and the importance of uh, proper burial is, is alluded to in this play. So Sophocles' Ajax, uh, 
is likely to be a source for at least one or two of the allusions within there. And Diodorus Siculus, the Bibliotheca Historica. So a number of Greek and Roman sources. Now the Greek tragedy elements in this are obvious. The, the you know, Titus's hubris, his pride, uh, is, which is based on a, a natural sense of honor and, and loyalty to the Roman Empire uh, is, is uh, obvious from the first act. His hemartia, the mistakes he made include the uh, allowing the dismemberment of Al Alarbus, the passing on becoming emperor himself, which Marcus offers to him, uh, his choosing a Saturninus, uh, who is obviously not uh, able, not, he, it's a progenitor thing, uh, but he's not a, a worthy emperor. And finally, the murder of his own son, Eudas, for protecting uh, Bassianus and, and Lavinia. Uh, and then his attempt to deny funereal rights to his son, which is very, very sad. Um, and because main burial rights is a big deal in the Greek uh, uh, tragedies, as, uh, like the, the you know, uh, Sophocles Antigone, the whole story is around this. Um, and in the end, uh, Lucius uh, has Aaron buried alive, and then he has Tamra sent off to be con consumed by beasts and birds. So once again, main funeral rites uh, at the beginning and at the very end of this play, appeasing the shadows with human sacrifice. The Greeks did this with Achilles' ghost calling for the sacrifice of Polyxena at the end of uh, the Trojan War, which then is part of the thing that, that condemns the Greeks to such miseries going home. And this is described in detail in the Trojan women, in Euripides' Trojan women. Intergenerational murder. Titus kills his daughter. Uh, he kills his son. Tamara arranges for the deaths of, of Titus's two sons. And then Titus, of course, kills Tamara's two sons. So we have a, a profusion of intergenerational murder in this. And then there's the mutilation and the cannibalism. Now, the cannibalism, most people say, well, it's, the, it's, it's his Seneca's Thyestes, that's the source of that. But in fact, in book one of uh, Herodotus, you find that the king Astyages has a premonition, a, a prophetic dream that his grandson, Cyrus, will depose him. So when Cyrus is born, he has his general take Cyrus to be exposed. Well, he, he hands him off to the shepherd, of course, and the shepherd's wife falls in love with him and raises Cyrus as her own. And then he's later recognized as, a, as, as royal. And, uh, uh, and in revenge for this, Astyages has Harpagus' son killed and then fed to Harpagus. Okay, so the idea of, 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 of cannibalizing your enemy's son uh, or sons, you know, is goes back to Herodotus, which is written, you know, uh, 500 years before Seneca got on this on this theme. All right. So insanity certainly Titus appears to be insane. Maybe he's mock insane, like Hamlet, uh, in, in Act Four. But by Act Five, he's got his, his groove back together. And he's very very clear about what he's doing is uh, great intensity, but there are there is a whole period in there in which he's shooting arrows toward the gods and ordering people to dig down to, to uh, find Astraea, the missing god of justice, goddess of justice in the underworld or on the seas. Uh, it is quite a, a, a crazy scene. Um, the animation in nature also found within the Greek canon when Titus says, these stones can hear, uh, listen to me better than people will. Or he says, these beheaded sons, they speak to me, these kinds of things that in the inanimate world still has an animating voice. Um, and references, of course, to pantheon of Greek gods and heroes, particularly Hecuba and Priam. Uh, Titus has 25 sons, Priam had 50. Uh, Titus was in a 10 year war with the Goths. Well, the Trojan War was 10 years also. So the parallels between Titus's experience and that of Hecuba and, and uh, Priam are underlined over and over again. And then there's a very brief sun salutation, which is characteristic of Greek drama, offered by Aaron when he sees when he sees what's happening with Tamara and that she's going to marry Saturninus and move on. Uh, here's what Jonathan Bates says about the supersaturation of Ovidian influence. Lavinia, reading the story of Philomela, rep uh, repetitions of the Terius and Procne story, where Terius has raped Philomela, and then when Procne learns about it through uh, Philomela's sewing uh, patterns, kills their son and then feeds them to Terius. And of course, they're all converted to birds by the gods at the end of the story in Ovid, okay? But this is mentioned no less than 14 times, okay? Plus bringing Ovid's book onto the stage as a prop during the, during the close, okay? References the stories of Hecuba and Priam, Actaeon and Diana, Pyramus and Thisbe, to Orpheus, charming the other gods, to Sinon's betrayal of Troy, to the debate between Ajax and Ulysses, to the centaur's feast, to the aphorism of Solon, and the Tarkin and Rape of Lucrece three times, i.e. lots of Ovidian influence uh, in this play. Uh, 
No, he did write uh, the, the book uh, Shakespeare and Ovid, so I think he has a very clear understanding of how that works. He also mentions the sources of the names of, for, for the two people vying to become emperor. Bassianus was the name of the third century emperor, better known as Caracalla, who vied with his brother over the succession, one of them appealing to primogenitor and the other to the people. In Herodian's history, and it was apparently available in an English translation, a tribune named Saturninus was sent to, to assassinate Bassianus. Okay, so those are the source of that names. Now, Titus, the name Titus is probably inspired by maybe the Titus who conquered Jerusalem. The Andronicus name comes from several different sources, possibly. There was an, em an emperor of Byzantium uh, who was known for punitive hand chopping and was shooting arrows with messages on them. So maybe that's part of the source. But I think more importantly, there's Livius Andronicus, who was a Greek Greco-Roman dramatist and epic poet who introduced drama to the Romans and produced the first formal play in Latin. I think that, that that's the reason we have Andronici there. And of course, Andronicus is one of the generals that are appointed by Antigonus to form a military council for his son, Demetrius, also another character described in Plutarch's Lives, Demetrius of Macedon, probably the source of the name Demetrius. Lucius, uh, who will become the future emperors, probably uh, derived from Lucius Junius Brutus, who expelled the Tarkins uh, from Rome and is represented, of course, in the Rape of Lucrece. Lucius is also the name of the first Christian king of England. So you had these palimpsests that layered upon, so that meant multiple meanings for these various names. Lavinia was named after the wife of Aeneas, and therefore the mother of Rome, the Andronici. The other Andronici is brother Marcus, uh, this uh, Martius and Quintus, Caius, Emilius, and Sempronius, the cousins. They're all clustered together in the life of Scipio, Africanus, and in, in parallel lives. And finally, Aaron also comes from Plutarch's lives and named after a Tuscan man called upon by Aaron to assist the Gauls when they march into Italy on the quest for who makes wine? How do we make wine? They wanted wine. <laughs> now, finally, we get to the juiciest part of this talk and I've got 10 more minutes or so, we can do this. All right, perhaps the strongest indication of Herodotian resonances in the play comes from Shakespeare's naming of the goth queen, Tamara, a close approximation of Tamreus, queen of the Masagedi and renowned conqueror of Cyrus the Great at the end of Herodotus' book one. She says, Herodotus is the primary source through which early modern readers learned of Tamreus and, uh, and her achievement. At least one early reader of the text seems to have made the connection between Tamreus and Tamara in the first folio. Tamara is misprinted in one occasion as Tamira. Now, Kiran says, was Scythia half so barbarous when they put off his older brother to be uh, dismembered? Herodotus quite identifies Tamreus as queen of the Masagedi and not of the Scythians. So they are the Scythian culture, but they're not Scythians, they're distinct from the Scythians. The Masagedi, unlike the Scythians, were considered to be the ancestors of European Goths, also known as the Geats. Okay, so you have Tamra, who's queen of the Goths, and you've got Tamreus, queen of the Masagedi or Geats, the Goths related. So another thing that ties them together is that Tamra's Goth strongly evokes Tamreus' Masagedi and that Tamra's motive for revenge upon Titus, that he refused mercy on her son, is exactly Tamreus' revenge on Cyrus. And briefly, to describe what's in Herodotus on this, Cyrus is advised that he lay a trap for the pursuing Masagedi army after the initial uh, war. Now, this, uh, the area is around Caspian Sea. Um, and Cyrus made the mistake of crossing the Araxes River into Asia, which uh, made it impossible to retreat. Okay, so the Persians lay a trap of the bandit cat containing much rich supply of wine. The Masagedi were not used to drinking wine. Their preferred intoxicant was hashish with fermented mare's milk. And they drank themselves into a stupor with the alcohol deliberately left behind by Cyrus. Then the Persians attacked, their opponents were incapacitated, the Masagedi were defeated, many were killed and they captured Sargapazes, Tamreus' son. Sargapazes coaxed Cyrus into removing his, sh his shackles and thus allowing him to commit suicide while in Persian captivity. This was the big problem. Tamreus has denounced his treachery and challenged into a second battle during which the Persians lost. Masagedi got the upper hand. According to Trogus Pompeius, 200,000 Persians were killed in that battle and with very high casualties. A direct quote from, from Herodotus. When the body of Cyrus was found, she took a skin and filled it full of human blood 
She had him beheaded and she dipped the head of Cyrus in the gore saying as she thus insulted the corpse, I live and have conquered thee in fight and yet by thee am I ruined for thou tookest my son with guile but thus I make good my threat and give thee thy fill of blood. Now further, this is Peter Paul Rubin's image of Tom, of Tom Reyes with the head of, of Cyrus. It was a famous artistic image. Uh, there are tapestries of this images and medieval uh, uh, interest in, in Tom Reyes. Tom Reyes is twice compared to Samirinus, the Assyrian queen who ruled during the absence of King Nais, also described in Herodotus and in Trogus Pompeius. Tom Reyes and Samirinus were both included among the female nine worthies of the Middle Ages, and they were represented in the pageant which preceded Henry VI when he entered the Paris in 1531. So they know much about her. She is, uh, she's associated with Judith who decapitated the Assyrian general Holofernes in biblical typology. The mirror magistrates mentions her positively. Robert Chester's love, loves martyr. She's described as full of nobleness. And finally in Shakespeare, she has a reference to Tom Reyes in Shakespeare. In Henry VI part one, the Countess of Auvergne waiting for Talbot to arrive to trap him says these lines, the plot is laid. If all things fall out right, I shall as famous be of this exploit as a Scythian Tamreus by Cyrus's death. Now the Wikipedia article on Tamreus says, Shakespeare's reference to Tamreus as queen of the Scythians rather than the usual Greek designation as the queen of the Basageti points to two possible likely sources. Marcus Junianus' Justice's abridged Trogus, Trogus Pompeius in Latin or possibly Arthur Golding's 1564 translation dedicated to the Earl of Oxford. And I found that reference, the citation is the reader's companion to the death of Shakespeare by John Benson in uh, 2016, okay? Uh, I have a copy of that book now. I had to follow up on that, on that site. The Wikipedia actually gave me something useful. Now you can get a copy and I got this Gale reprint of Justin's history. Uh, it's not by uh, translated by uh, Arthur Golding, but it is a 1712 edition. So I presume that much of the material is identical to that. And in fact, the descriptions of Cyrus's birth, uh, the the story of Astyages and King and, and General Harpagus um, and Tom, Tom Reyes and Semiramis are all in Book One also of Justin's history. Now, if you look at what Arthur Golding was doing in the 1560s, the mid 1560s is quite interesting from the point of view of sources for an inspiration for Titus Andronicus. Golding's um, uh, first publication was Aretine's History of the Wars Between the Imperials and the Goths for the Possession of Italy, dedicated to William Cecil in 1563. And 64 is a Trogus book that uh, it begins with the reign of King Ninus and the husband who's the, sem the husband of Samirinus. Sem Incidentally, Samirinus built the brick wall that separates Pyramus and Thisbe. You know, so just so you know, there's, there's tie-ins even with uh, Midsummer Night's Dream. Uh, the dedication of Trogus, uh, Golding urged Oxford to let the example of classic heroes encourage you to proceed in learning and virtue and yourself thereby become equal to any of your predecessors in advancing the honor of your noble house. And then in 65, of course, he began to publish the first four books of Ovid's Metamorphoses dedicated to the Earl of Leicester. In his dedication to Trogus, uh, he also I, I mentions that Alexander the Great uh, carried a copy of uh, the Iliad with him wherever he went and uh, had it under his pillow. So. He, he has a lot to say about uh, encouraging Oxford to study those classics. So Jane Grogan in conclusion says that Shakespeare's play evokes a well-known set of narratives centered on the figure of Cyrus the Great, founder of the ancient Persian empire. These intertextual residences work not only in Tamara's favor, but also provides a positive moral cast for the play's central image of the disaster that has befallen Rome, the swallowing womb, which the detested pit that uh, they throw the Bassianus uh, body into and where uh, tit the Titus's two sons find themselves falling into and which, which is part of their way, way of being convicted. Now, Tanya Pollard, well, I'll just have one slide to share with her about this, about the use of Hecuba as an image that, that associated with Tamara. In the wake of Titus's sacrifices of Alarbus, Tamara takes on the authority of Greek tragic maternity and Titus is linked to the Thracian tyrant Polymester who incurs Hecuba's wrath for killing her son. There is a specific reference to Euripides Hecuba as Demetrius mentions, the revenge takes place in a tent, a detail not included in the narratives of Ovid or Seneca. Depicting child sacrifice and maternal grief and bolstered by specific allusions to Queen Hecuba, the play's opening scene draws on Greek tragic models that direct sympathy away from Titus. This next slide, just a repeat of that. Finally, 
there is a lot of classical quotes within this. Now I'll just talk about one. Terras Astrea Reliquit. You remember Marcus, she's gone. She's fled that, that Astrea, the goddess of justice is, is, is gone. Now in Metamorphosis book five, the departure of Australia, the last of the immortals to be on, on earth signals the age of iron, the time of violence and social discord. The primary sins of the iron age, according to Ovid is mining and seafaring. What does Titus do? He specifically directs his uh, family members to, to go on the sea and try to find Australia there, dig down uh, to uh, Hades to find her there. And then he shoots arrows into heaven to find her there. All right, so there's an ironic nature of Titus is saying that she's gone, she's fled but he's doing exactly the kinds of things that are, he, he orders the kinds of things that would be opposed to that. And then finally, the goth princes are idiots because uh, Titus sends them weapons in a, a Latin quote, the man who translates in, the man pure of life and clean of wickedness does not need the arrows of the bow of the moor. Chiron says, oh, tis a verse of Horace, I know it well, I read it as a grammar long ago. And then aside, Aaron says, oh, what an ass, you know, what a thing to be an ass. There's no sound just the old man hath found their guilt. That Chiron has no idea what the meaning of that is. And even young Lucius knows enough Latin to know that they've been accused of rape and murder. In conclusion, Titus Andronicus is an early tragedy of blood or horror that represents palimpsest of literary illusions and a complex self-conscious integrated improvisation, of, improvisation upon classical sources, most notably the Metamorphoses of Ovid in one of Shakespeare's most inventive plays. The Persian context represented by Queen Tamarius and Tamara's associate with the Greek tragic icon of Hecuba reveal an underappreciated impact of Greek history and drama on this lamentable Roman tragedies. And finally, as an Oxfordian tags to remind you, Golding's translations of the 1653-65 uh, relate to this play very closely that, that Oxford possessed Boyardo's translation of Herodotus. He also had Amiot's translation of Parallel Lives. And that Underdown's translation of Heliodorus's Ethiopia dedicated to Oxford is also a likely source. And now we, uh, these are the primary sources. I'm glad to provide this material for you since I know I'm running out of time here. I have one more thing to say here. This is from Head Over Heels. Whoops, I'll go back. This is a, an image from Head Over Heels, which is produced at, actually at the Shakespeare Festival here. We are head over heels about you. And I can tell, tell you now that I've walked the boards, taken a bow and worn the crown on those boards and I have fair witnesses to prove it as much. All right, thank you so much for indulging me this wonderful opportunity to speak to you about a play that I had very little uh, 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 things to say about before Ben <laughs> bought this book. Thank you. Thanks so much, Earl. Uh, fascinating talk. And there were some questions and comments which we will forward to you since we are um, out of time, but really fascinating. Thanks again. Our next speaker today is Catherine Chilgen. Catherine is an independent scholar who has studied the Shakespeare authorship question for over three decades. In 2011, she published Shakespeare Suppressed, the uncensored truth about Shakespeare and his works which earned her an award for distinguished scholarship from Concordia University in Oregon. She has debated the authorship question with English professors at the Smithsonian Institution, at Concordia University, and at the Mechanics Institute in San Francisco, and has written numerous articles on the topic. A frequent guest on podcasts, she's a member of the board of directors of the Shakespeare Authorship Coalition. Catherine's talk is titled, A Newly Discovered Portrait of Oxford's Sister, Lady Mary Veer. Welcome, Catherine. Hello, everybody. I'm Catherine Children, and my topic is about a portrait that I think is of Mary Vere, who is Oxford's sister, the Earl of Oxford. And here she is. This 16th century portrait of a young lady is at the Beanie House of Art and Knowledge in Canterbury, England. According to the inscription, she is 15 years old and her picture made in 1567. She wears an elaborate outfit covered with pearls, gold link chains, and two jeweled pendants. Clearly, she came from a wealthy aristocratic family. A similar costume was worn by Elizabeth, Countess of Lincoln, uh, seen here on the left, which is at the National Gallery of Ireland. For over 100 years, the Beanie House Lady has been identified as Lady Susan Bertie later Countess of Kent. On January 1st, 1555, Lady Susan and her mother fled England to Europe in fear of religious persecution. She was one year old at the time, according to the contemporary historian, John Fox. Bertie's birth year, therefore, was late 1553 or early 1554. 
The Beanie House Lady, however, was born circa 1552 as gleaned from the inscription. This is the first reason to doubt Susan Bertie is the lady portrayed. This lady also lacks facial resemblance to her supposed parents, Richard Bertie and Catherine, Baroness Willoughby de Eresby and Duchess of Suffolk. Bertie's father had brown hair and her mother's hair was shown brown in one portrait and red in another earlier portrait. Both portraits show straight hair. The Beanie House Lady has curly red hair. This contrasts with that of her supposed brother, Peregrine Bertie, who had straight brown hair. No other Susan Bertie portrait survives to compare this with, but there is an alleged portrait of her also inscribed 1567, which appears on the Tudor Times website. It was previously titled in an auction as Portrait of a Lady. If it is Susan Bertie, then she and the Beanie House Lady are two different people. In 1570, Susan Berti, about age 16, married Reynold Gray of Rest. Two years later, she became a countess when Gray successfully reclaimed the Earldom of Kent. He died soon after. Berti remarried in 1581 to the soldier Sir John Wingfield. He died 15 years later during the capture of Cadiz. Widowed and impoverished, Berti received a hundred pound annuity from the crown. She was still alive in 1611. Her only child, Per Ren Winfield, was alive in 1599, named in his uncle's will. The Beanie House portrait's earliest known history is that in 1912, it was in the Earl of Lindsay's art collection. This earldom was created in 1626 for Bertie's nephew, Robert Bertie, her brother's eldest son a title that continues today. If Peregrine Winfield predeceased his mother or died childless, childless, then his mother's property would likely have passed to her brother's family, thus explaining the portrait's provenance. A simpler explanation, however, is that the Beanie House lady is not Susan Berti, but another aristocratic lady of the Berti family of a similar age. Lady Mary Vere, daughter of the 16th Earl of Oxford. She had a definite tie to the first Earl of Lindsay. She was his mother. Mary Vere was married to Susan Bertie's brother, Peregrine. A 17th century record shows that a portrait of Mary Vere was at Grimsthorpe Castle, Lincolnshire, the Bertie family seat. The presence chamber held a portrait described as my old Lord Peregrine, one of my old Lady Mary. Was this picture the Beanie House Lady? Or was it this full length portrait of Lady Mary Vere once owned by the Berti family? This engraving appeared in an 1896 book about the family. It is another previously unknown portrait of Mary as far as, far as I know. She looks about age 50, her fingers touching the head of a big dog. Her dress was described as red and her rough white. This is a portrait um, of Lady Mary's son, Robert, her eldest son, who was similarly portray portrayed with a large dog. Mary's Full-length picture was auctioned in 1949, today's location unknown. Her dress was described as red, the rough wife, which we already, I already said, okay. The portrait's inscription added by a later hand reads, Mary de Vere, only heiress to Edward, Earl of Oxford. That was true before Edward took his 1575 European tour. Thereafter, he had three daughters. In absence of a color image of this picture, Mary Veer's looked can be, looks can be discerned from surviving portraits of her brother, Edward, in the middle, 
and her half-sister, Lady Mary Vere, the Baroness Windsor. The Beanie House Lady not only resembles them, but shares their traits of high foreheads, arched brows, blue eyes, and curly red hair. Notably, stars appear in the Beanie House inscription, possibly alluding to the De Vere family's heraldic symbol. Like the Beanie House portrait, Catherine Vere's portrait is inscribed 1567. Both pictures have identical dimensions and artist attribution, which is master of the Countess of Warwick, now Lady Arnold Derrickson. If these two ladies are sisters, then these portraits could have been painted at the same time. Side note about Catherine Veer. Her birth year is unknown, but inscriptions on two surviving portraits say she is age 24 in 1567 and age 25 in 1568, making her birth year circa 1543. This should dismiss claims made by the Oxford DNB and others that she was born about three to five years earlier. Catherine Vere likely married Edward Baron Windsor soon after he succeeded the barony in 1558, when she was about age 15. Their first son was born in 1559, followed by three more shown in this family picture. Mary Veer's birth year is also unknown. Her parents married August 1548. Her brother Edward was born in April 1550. The Beanie House lady was born circa 1552, a date that works for Mary. Mary, however, was not mentioned in her father's will of December 1552, but she was mentioned in the Visitation of Essex of 1552, although there is some doubt that the visitation actually occurred that year. But we don't know 100%. Mary Veer wedded Peregrine Berti sometime after Christmas 1577 and before March 12, 1578. Despite previous disapproval by Queen Elizabeth I, Berti's parents and her brother, her parents were then deceased. The couple had known each other as teenagers while living in the household of William Cecil, Lord Burley. If she is the Beanie House lady, then she was three years older than Peregrine, who was born in October 1555, which perhaps influenced the marriage objection. If this portrait is Mary Vere, then Beanie House has a singular honor, owning a portrait of William Shakespeare's sister, Shakespeare being the pen name of the 17th Earl of Oxford, which was later confused with William Shaxford of Stratford-on-Avon. With this in mind, a marriage re referred to in Love, Slaver's Lost was likely that of Mary and Peregrine. The princess asked Lady Maria if she knows Lord Longaville. And Lady Maria says, I know him, madam, at a marriage feast between Lord Perigore and the beauteous heir of Jake's Falconbridge, solemnized. In Normandy saw I this long of ill. Lady Maria is the princess's attendant, just as Lady Mary Vere was Queen Elizabeth's attendant. Lady Maria knows Lord Longaville from the marriage feast of Lord Paragord and the beauteous heir of Jack's Falconbridge. She saw him in Normandy, it is believed the De Vere family ancestors came from Normandy. Lady Maria continues, a man of sovereign parts he is esteemed, well fitted in arts, glorious in arms. Nothing becomes him ill that he would will well, that he would well. The only soil of his fair virtue's gloss, if virtue's gloss will stain it with any soil, is a sharp wit matched with too blunt a will, whose edge hath power to cut, whose will still wills, it should none spare that come within his power. 
So Longueville is glorious in arms and has a sharp wit, characteristics applicable to Peregrine Berti, a career soldier and diplomat. An early obituary called him pregnant in wit and practiced especially in martial or military actions. In a personal letter, Berti admitted that he is testy and choleric, which is part of my nature, accounting for Longueville's cutting wit. Further into the same scene, Longueville asks Boyet about Lady Maria's parents. Longueville, Longueville says, pray you, sir, whose daughter? Boyet, her mother's, I've heard. Longueville, God's blessing on your beard. Boyet, good sir, be not offended. She is an heir of Falconbridge. Longueville, nay, my collar is ended. She is a most sweet lady. Lady Maria is an heir of Falconbridge, indicating a relation between her and the beauteous heir of Jake's Falconbridge. This could be another clue that Lady Maria is Lady Mary Vere, who was once her brother's main heir. His 1575 will noted that his whole possession would pass to her. She was evidently famous for this as it was inscribed on her portrait with the dog. Note how Longueville's color was raised by Boyette's teasing, Peregrine Berti's self-described characteristic. The beauteous heir married Lord Paracourt, a name that sounds a lot like Lord Peregrine. Also, Longueville calls Lady Maria fair son. Fair and Veer, or Ver, were similarly pronounced. Longueville and Maria later couple in the play. Altogether, it appears that the marriage alluded to was that of Mary Veer and Peregrine Berti, which the playwright, Mary's brother, wished to memorialize. In other Shakespeare plays, the name Falconbridge hints at the Earl of Oxford. In King John, Philip Falconbridge was accused of bastardy by his brother, who wants him disinherited. Oxford was accused of the same thing by his half-sister, Catherine. In Merchant of Venice, Falconbridge is a young baron of England and Portia's suitor. Nerissa says, what say you then to Falconbridge, the young baron of England? Portia, you know, I say nothing to him, for he understands not me, nor I him. He hath neither Latin, French, nor Italian. He is a proper man's picture, but alas, who can converse with a dumb show? How oddly he is suited. I think he bought his doublet in Italy, his round hose in France, his bonnet in Germany, and his behavior everywhere. This describes Oxford in reverse. In an apparent self-mockery, Oxford did know those languages, was a nonstop talker, wore European clothing, and writer Gabriel Harvey lampooned him for adopting Italian manners. A Falcon Bridge is also cited in Henry V and in Henry VI, parts one and part three. Curiously, the anonymous 16th century comedy called Look About You features a Lady Marian Falcon Bridge, sister to the humorous, quote unquote, Earl of Gloucester. And she was called Beauteous. The Berti marriage reference dates Love's Labor's Lost, circa 1578, which is incompatible with orthodoxy's 1594-1595. Yet in 1578, a contemporary author evidently knew the play. In context of books and authors, John Florio wrote this line in Florio, His First Fruits. We not... We need not speak so much of love. All books are full of love with so many authors that it were labor lost to speak of love. First Fruits also included the phrase, Venitia, qui non ti vedi, non ti pretia, which was quoted in Love's Labor's Lost. 
First Fruits subtitle says the book contains familiar speech, merry proverbs, witty sentences, and golden sayings, pointing to possible Shakespeare borrowings. Since the play was imprinted until the 1590s, Florio must have seen a performance before his book's registration in August, 1578. In 1587, the court comedy Endymion by John Lilly also echoes a line from Love's Labor's Lost. Endymion in Act Five. I will not command love for it cannot be enforced. Let me entreat it. And in Love's Labor's Lost, shall I command thy love? I may. Shall I enforce thy love? I could. Shall I entreat thy love? I will. Lily was Oxford's private secretary in the 1580s. In 1598, Love's Labor's Lost was an old play, wrote Robert Toft in his book Alba. Love's Labor's Lost, I once did see a play, he clept so. The Reader's Encyclopedia of Shakespeare says that once suggests a considerable span of time. Perhaps Toft saw a performance in 1581 while a student at Oxford University where plays were often performed. Interestingly, the preceding poem in Alba was Toft wearing tawny and black due to his forsaken love. Tawny and black, my courtly colors be. Tawny, because forsook I am, I wear. Black, since mine Alba's love is dead to me. This exact theme and phrasing occurred in the Earl of Oxford's 1576 poem. For black and tawny will I wear, which morning colors be. Queen Elizabeth viewed Love's Labor's Lost according to the play's first surviving edition. The evidence therefore suggests the play was initially presented at the Queen's Court as early as 1578. The lines describing Peregrine Berti's character, however, were likely later editions as he would be addressed as Lord after November 1580 when he inherited Barony of Willoughby and his fame as a brave soldier started in 1586. Interestingly, in 1582, Queen Elizabeth sent Peregrine to Elsinore Castle in Denmark, where Shakespeare's tragedy, Hamlet, is set, to invest the Danish king as a garter knight. Another character, Maria, in Twelfth Night, could also portray Mary Vere. She, like Lady Maria in Love's Labor's Lost, is a gentle lady's attendant, like Mary Vere was attendant to Queen Elizabeth. And noted by the Ogburns, Sir Andrew Eggcheek greets Maria, saying, bless you, fair shrew. Fair and Vere were similarly pronounced. She also called, is called fair lady and true bred. Vere means truly or true in Latin and Italian. Fair shrew suggests Shakespeare's comedy Taming of the Shrew, in which a shrewish lady marries Petruchio, a name that could also suggest Peregrine. Maria, who is called Mary four times in the play, is witty and is a practical joker. Lady Maria in Love's Aber's Loss also partakes in witty and body repartee. Two scenes later in Twelfth Night, the clout says to Maria, many a good hanging prevents a bad marriage and for turning away, let summer bear it out. The Ogburns, and this is in this star of England, saw this line as Oxford Shakespeare's advice to his sister to not turn away from her marriage. Within the first year, a letter reported a certain unkindness grown between Peregrine and Mary. Mary didn't turn away, but about 20 years later, they were formally separated. They had seven children. Here is a portrait of her second son, Peregrine Berti Jr. 
And here is a portrait on the right of her eldest son, Robert Berti, later the Earl of Lindsay. Peregrine Sr. died in 1601. Mary remarried, but separated not long after. She died about age 72 in Hackney, supposedly on June 24, 1624. Her brother died on the very same day, 20 years previously, also in Hackney. In conclusion, documented in the 17th century was a portrait of Lady Mary Vere at Grimsthorpe Castle, where she lived. Considered lost, it could be the Beanie House portrait, currently identified as Lady Susan Berti, who was Mary's sister-in-law. Age, provenance, and a strong resemblance to Mary's siblings favor her as this lady. If so, then the portrait was traditionally known as Susan Berti, or someone in modern times made an incorrect guess. Such misidentifications are common. For example, Lady Catherine Veer's portrait was once identified as Lady Jane Grey. This portrait of Mary Veer reveals her birth year, circa 1552, and confirms that she was beauteous like Lady Maria in Love's Labor's Lost. Reclaiming it as a portrait of the true Shakespeare's sister helps to bring in living art, a quote from Love, Love's Labor's Lost, the great author's family and characters. Hopefully one day pictures of Oxford's mother Marjorie and father John, the 16th Earl, will turn up too, or perhaps get re-identified. The portrait of Edward de Vere, 17th Earl of Oxford, is on the cover of my book, Shakespeare Suppress, the Uncensored Truth about Shakespeare and his works. Thank you very much. Wonderful, Catherine. Thank you so much for that fascinating talk. Uh, where is the portrait house today? I may have missed that if it was in the beginning of your talk. It's at the Beanie House of Art and Knowledge in Canterbury, Kent in England. Great. And do you think that there is any uh, possibility that um, it was intentionally misattributed or you think it's likely just an error? I think it was an error. I mean, it, it came from uh, the collection of the Earl of Lindsay, so it was probably passed down through the generations and it easily have been misidentified. Right. Great. Well, lots of praise for your talk. It was really interesting. Thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate it. And our next speaker is Roger Strittmatter. Um, let me tell you a little bit about Roger. Uh, Roger's the Associate Professor of Humanities and Literature at Coppin State University. He has numerous publications in peer-reviewed journals of literary studies, psychoanalysis, anthropology, and forensic studies. His 2001 University of Massachusetts PhD dissertation on the De Vere Geneva Bible uh, was reviewed in the New York Times in 2002 by William S. Niedekorn. Roger was honored in 2013 as the Oxfordian of the Year, and he has published 116 articles with more than 20 in peer-reviewed academic journals, including the Shakespeare Yearbook, the Review of English Studies, Notes and Queries, and the Scandinavian Psychoanalytic Review. He's the co-author with Lynn Kaczynski of On the Date, Sources, and Design of Shakespeare's The Tempest, and with Alexander Waugh, a new Shakespeare illusion book, Literary Allusions to Shakespeare, 1584 to 1786 from Historical Principles, which will be coming out soon. Roger has appeared in two Shakespeare authorship documentaries, Last Will and Testament, 2012, and Nothing is Truer Than Truth, 2018. His research interests include Ben Johnson and the 1623 Folio, Early Modern Esoteric and Memory Traditions, and Shakespeare in the Bible. Roger's talk today is titled, A Kingdom for a Mirth, Shakespeare's Fatal Cleopatra and the Authorship Question. Welcome, Roger. Good afternoon. Uh, colleagues, lend me your ears and let us see what we can discover together about our theme, A Kingdom for a Mirth, Shakespeare's Fatal Cleopatra and the authorship question. Let's begin with the problem. 
uh, begin at the end and work our way back to see uh, how the end came to be what it is and see if the problem becomes a triumph. Here is a rural old fellow that will not be denied your highness presence. He brings you figs. Let him come in. But poor an instrument may do a noble deed. He brings me liberty. My resolution's placed, and I have nothing of woman in me. Now, from head to foot, I am marble constant. Now the fleeting moon, no planet is of mine. This is the man. Avoid and leave him. I saw the pretty worm of Nihilus there, which kills and pains not. I truly are, I have him. But, but I would not be the party that should desire you to touch him. For his biting is immortal. Those that do die of it do seldom or never recover. Remember, thou any that have died on? Well, very many men and uh, women too. I heard of one of them no longer than yesterday, a very honest woman, but something given to lie, as a woman should not do, but in the way of honesty. How she died of the biting of it, what pain she felt. Uh, truly, she makes a very good report of the worm, but he that believes all they say shall never be saved by half that they do. But, but this is most certain, the worms, an odd worm. Get thee hence. Farewell. I wish you all joy of the worm. Farewell. You must think this, look you, that the worm will do his kind. Aye, aye, farewell. Look you, the worm is not to be trusted but in the keeping of wise people, for indeed there is no goodness in the worm. Take thou no care. It shall be heeded. Very good. But give me nothing, I pray you. For it is not worth the feeding. Will it eat me? <laughs> you must not think I'm so simple, but I know the devil himself will not eat a woman. I, I know that a woman is a dish for the gods. Ah, I, I wish you joy of the womb. You are watching clips of Antony and Cleopatra from the Stratford, Ontario production, directed by Barry Average, starring Geraint Wynne Davies and Yana McIntosh. I have endeavored without success to learn the name of the actor who is playing the countryman in this scene. If anyone can figure that out, let me know. Uh, Richard Uzunian, uh, writing for the Toronto Star, praises the unquenchable warmth of Win Davies, Antony, and the overwhelming power of Macintosh's Cleopatra in a filmic version in which small scenes that were gems on the stage become artful cinematic choices. Yet I hope that even, and perhaps especially in a fine production like this one, we can hear that there's a problem here. As Robert Ornstein explains, this scene would be less difficult if it were more obviously solemn and serious. The comic note struck in her conversation with the clown persists and mingles with the ceremonial mystery of Cleopatra's death. Now and then we may wish that Cleopatra had a more sober view of her own catastrophe, which she treats as a marriage feast, not where she eats, but where she is eaten, a tender domestic scene, an apotheosis, and even a practical joke on the universal landlord, Caesar. And in case you weren't counting, the scene repeats the word worm nine times. Why worm? In 1998, Richard Whalen, writing in the Shakespeare Oxford newsletter, gave an answer. The plays he wrote are full of puns and wordplay, some of it multilingual. The English worm thus can be seen here as a pun on the French ver, standing for de ver, the English dramatist with the French surname. I was still in graduate school, and at the time I was not immediately fully convinced by Richard Whelan's argument. Let me tell you why I changed my mind. And let's start with 
what does the literary establishment have to say about this concept? Well, we can hardly get more establishment than Dr. Johnson, the editor of the Oxford English Dictionary and quite a fine Shakespeare scholar in his own right. A quibble, writes Johnson, is to Shakespeare what luminous vapors are to the traveler. He follows it at all adventures. It is sure to lead him out of his way and sure to engulf him in the mire. It has some malignant power over his mind and its fascinations are irresistible. A quibble was to him the fatal Cleopatra for which he lost the world. But what do modern literary scholars who study puns have to say about this? Well, let's listen to Jackie Rubenstein in his A Dictionary of Shakespeare's Sexual Puns and Their Significance. You probably didn't know that such a book exists, but it does, and it's quite an interesting book. According to Rubenstein, when lines seem trite, self-evident, or repetitive, or even lacking in sense, it may be that a pun carries the meaning. Samuel Johnson's criticism should be reversed. Reason, propriety, and truth were not sacrificed by the Shakespearean quibble. They emerge from it. So with this in mind as a brief introduction, we have seen that there's a problem, the repetition of the word worm, and we are exploring the possibility that this is because Shakespeare is punning on the name De Vere. Let's move forward now into play and take a look at these six themes, each one briefly, anachronism or allegory, fortune telling, transmutation, animal spirits, Shakespeare's fatal Cleopatra in 5-2, and Caesar's bad fortune and the author's design. This play is full of anachronism. Cleopatra plays billiards, a name, a game unknown in ancient Egypt, according to most authorities. Indeed, Shakespeare approaches anachronism from several different perspectives in this play. Anachronism just, of course, meaning something is out of time. It's not properly fitted to the time it belongs in. And, and, and this makes it difficult because he does this several times. It's difficult to believe he's not using this for his own allegorical or prophetic purposes. In the second example, Cleopatra complains that posterity will see a child actor boy her greatness in the posture of a whore. How could Cleopatra know that in the Elizabethan age, boys would play female roles? Perhaps for the first time, moreover, to make a point, the point vivid, Shakespeare transforms the noun boy into a verb. Such violations of historical logic and grammar have often been regarded as aesthetic defects or proof of Shakespeare's historical naivete. But is that really what they are? Let's try fortune telling. In the second scene, we overhear Charmian and Iris begging to have their fortunes told by the soothsayer. Let's listen. Where's the soothsayer that you praised so to the queen? Oh, that I knew this husband, which you say must change his horns with garments. Soothsayer, your will. Is this the man? Is you, sir, that know things? In nature's infinite book of secrecy, a little I can read. Show him your hand. Good, sir. Give me good fortune. I make not but foresee. Pray then foresee me one. <laughs> you shall be yet far fairer than you are. He means in flesh. No, you shall paint when you are old. <laughs> Wrinkles from dead. Vex not his prescience. Be attentive. Hush! In this scene, characters in Cleopatra's royal household are joking about having their fortunes told. This is Shakespeare's way of announcing that a major theme of the play will be fortune, a word that appears with slight variations 44 times in this play. Given that this is a historical drama about historical figures, the distinguished um, American critic Kenneth Burke reminds us, and this is a little difficult, but by the time we're finished, I think you will understand this. Burke says, fortune is none other than the form given by the playwright to the play. In other words, how does this play shape our understanding of the fortunes of the historical characters it portrays, characters like Cleopatra, Antony, or Caesar? 
before we can answer this question, we must consider our third topic, transmutation. Antony and Cleopatra is a play rich in allusions to ancient and Renaissance belief in the fourfold typology of matter, air, water, fire, and earth. All these forms of being are in unstable, in an unstable state of flux in every scene in this play. It is packed with complex alchemical imagery, frequently involving melting, mixing, dissolving, or other forms of transmutation of the basic elements. And let me just recommend here, for those interested specifically in this alchemical reading of the play, Julia Cleves, a uh, wonderful and alchemical reading of Shakespeare's Antony and Cleopatra, which you can find online at Tomenos Online. But the alchemical dimensions of this play have long been understood by Shakespeare scholars. Whatever our elements, confirms G. Wilson Knight, whether of feasting and drinking, passionate lust or military splendor, they are transformed by a peculiar alchemy into essences intensely spiritual and rarefied. The play views its world as one rising from matter to spirit, and hence seeing all things in terms not of their immediate appeal, but of their potential significance. We find that all here is from the first, finely gilded with the tint of spiritual apprehension, all of which is expressive, I would argue, of the influence of Ovid's metamorphosis on Shakespeare's reading of Plutarch and the Antony and Cleopatra story. Our fourth theme is transmigration. While transmutation refers to the remaking of physical forms, transmigration involves the passage of some spiritual essence or value of the human soul, perhaps, into a new physical form, often that of an animal. Um, the image that you see here uh, is what I found searching online under the search term transmigration. And I was fascinated by it. So let me tell you what this is an image of. This is a group of, uh, of dancers and actors, performers uh, from the Ojibwe culture in British Columbia. And this is what they say about their production called transmigration. Transmigration tells the story of this troubled genius who shed light on the identity crisis that was becoming an overwhelming part of the native Canadian experience. And what I find fascinating about that quotation is that if you just stop the sentence just shy of the conclusion, uh, it applies equally to the topic that we are considering here. We are considering, we are remembering the story of a troubled genius who sh has shed light on the human identity crisis. Transmigration is a major motif in this play. Um, in scene two seven, the drunky, drunken party goers on board B Pompey's barge, suspended in a crocodile world between sea and land, discuss crocodiles and transmigration. And Antony says, the crocodile lives by that which nourisheth it and the elements once out of it it transmigrates. In the play's hermetic alchemical dimension, animals represent a stage in the soul's transmigration through the cosmos. By observing, interacting with, and sometimes imitating animals, humans come to know themselves through a process of identification or rejection. Somewhere between transmigration and transmutation, in this play, characters assume various animal attributes, becoming spirit animals. For example, the play makes much of Cleopatra's own serpentine associations or Antony's with the horse, which was associated with lust in a tradition going back long before Shakespeare. So, I mean, where thinks thou he is now? Stand he or sit he? Or does he walk? <laughs> or is he on his horse? Oh, happy horse <laughs> to bear the weight of Antony. Do bravely, horse. For what thou whom thou movest? The demi atlas of the earth, the arm and burgeonet of men. He's speaking now or murmuring. 
where's my serpent of old nine? <laughs> For so he calls me. Oh, now I feed myself with most delicious poison. Think on me that am with Phoebus, amorous pinches, black and wrinkles deep in time. Broad-fronted Caesar, when thou was here above the ground, I was a morsel for a monarch. He's speaking now. Where's my serpent of old Nile? For, from Mackenzie Herbert's exceptional manuscript essay, The Spirit Animals of Shakespeare, we can put this in a little bit larger context. She writes that through the symbolic connection of Cleopatra to the snake or the asp, quote, Shakespeare has created what modern readers would call a spirit animal for his character. This theme of characters aligning with certain animal imagery and traits is repeated throughout Shakespeare's plays, resulting in a multitude of animal identities that provide further insight on the character as a multi-dimensional creation. We should add that such spirit animals also provide higher functions in the plays than merely providing character development. They do that, but they do also much more. Let's find out. Cleopatra's serpentine associations were not invented by Shakespeare. They are already visible in the Potomac era bas relief on the left and uh, Michelangelo in the sketch on the right. Uh, I'm not sure actually which way you guys are seeing that. So that's my right and left. Um, Michelangelo is still on the same wavelength, obviously, in this 15, 15, 1533 sketch of Cleopatra's very snaky tresses. Transmutation goes both ways. It can be an act of love or an act of anger. In my face that ends me be free and helpful. So tart a favor to trumpet such good tidings. If not well, thou shouldst come like a, a fury crowned with snakes, not like a formal man. Wilt please you, hear me. I have a mind to strike thee at our feet. And if thou say Anthony lives, is well, or friends with Caesar, or must cast the tooth. I'll set thee in a shower of gold and hail rich pearls upon me. Madam, he's well. Well said. Oh, and friends with Caesar. Thou art an honest man. Caesar and he are greater friends than ever. <laughs> Make thee a fortune from me. <laughs> but yet, madam. I do not like but yet. It does allay the good precedent. Spy upon but yet. But yet is as a jailer to bring forth some monstrous malefactor. For these friends. Pour out the pack of matter to my ear, the good and bad together. He's, he's friends with me. Friends of health, thou sayest, and thou sayest, free. Free, madam. No, I made no such report. He's bound to Octavia. For what good turn? For the best turn in the bed. Madam, he's married to Octavia. Most infectious pestilence upon me. The good madam, patience. What say you? Yeah. Head for the yeah. Lord, for I turn mine eyes like balls before me. Yeah. And hair thy head, thy arm. Thou shalt be whipped with wire and stewed in brine, smarting and lingering tickle. Oh, gracious madam, I beg to bring the news, make not the match. Say it is not so. For province I will give thee and make thy fortunes proud. The blow thou hast shall make thy peace for moving me to rage. And I will do thee with what gift besides thy modesty can beg. He's married, madam. Rogue, thou hast lived too long. <gasps> May then not run. What mean you, madam? I have made no fault. Good madam, keep yourself within yourself. The man is innocent. Come, innocent, escape not the thunderbolt. Melt Egypt into Nile. And kindly creatures turn all to serpents. In this play, Cleopatra's association with the snake is complex and ethically charged. She herself, it seems, can punish other humans by turning them into animals, especially snakes. Melt Egypt into Nile, and kindly creatures turn all to serpents. Notice also that this utterance from the climax of a series of verbal and even physical threats and physical actions 
rising to a crescendo in which eventually not merely the messenger, but the entire land is threatened with cataclysm. And this speech immediately follows Charmian's good madam, keep yourself within yourself. Kenneth Burke again. Antony, he says, is a warrior who is languishing as the result of a sexual infatuation with an exotic serpent of old Nile, who eventually kills herself by the sting of a serpent. The serpent is a unifying symbol in the play. And what Burke calls a serpent is, of course, in the text, in the scene we just saw, called a worm. And it is within this larger hermetic, alchemical, and symbolic context that we should interpret the significance of that word worm as a symbol and an embodiment of a spiritual being. Plutarch records that, quote, some report that this aspic was brought into her in the basket with figs and that she had commanded them to hide it under the fig leaves, that when she should take it out of the figs, the aspic should bite her before she should see her. Shakespeare elaborates this part of Plutarch into 36 lines of obscure and sexually charged comedy between Cleopatra and the countryman who brings the basket. Now we can verify the significance of the different naming conventions of the play by collating them as I've done for you on this screen. The word worm occurs only in the Cleopatra countryman scene where it is used nine times. And for what it is worth, the countryman calls the worm an odd worm. Uh, Frankie Rubenstein explains that though a pun not, need not be repeated in order to be valid, when it is, we feel confirmed in our judgment. But what kind of a worm must only be kept by the wise? In qualifying Richard Whalen's hypothesis, we should acknowledge that the worm is not or is not only a man. He is also an idea, an idea that must be kept safely by the wise, since as the countryman declares, there is no goodness in the worm. This statement links both Shakespeare's play and more specifically the figure of the worm within the play to Renaissance ideals of esotericism of the belief that the truth can only be expressed, so to speak, between the lines. The link was reinforced for English Protestants in the Geneva Bible note to Isaiah 66, 24, in which the worm becomes a memento mori, a worm of conscience. Indeed, the doctrine that dangerous ideas must be safeguarded by the wise is the core philosophical value of this broad tradition of esoteric discourse which Arthur Melzer documents in this 2014 University of Chicago study, Philosophy Between the Lines. The book demonstrates convincingly that all philosophical discourse and therefore all poetry before the 19th century was esoteric by intent and design. Theme number six, Caesar's bad fortune. We all know the cliche, the winners write history, not in this play. In this play, Caesar wins money, but loses heart from, hearts from start to finish. Caesar marries his sister to a man he despises and then wars to erase her dishonor. He hungers for Cleopatra, but his desire to possess her is more shameless and more contemptible. He is indifferent to Anthony's fate. He would be content if Cleopatra murders her lover. He lies to Cleopatra, cajoles her, and threatens her children in order to keep her alive so that she may be displayed as his trophy in Rome. And again, these are direct quotes or nearly direct quotes from Robert Ornstein. Uh, Kenneth Burke reminds us, and I'm going to give you that quote again and give you a little more context for it. Kenneth Burke reminds us, quote, the playwright in this final scene, and he means the scene we just saw plus the scene we're about to see, 5-2, the playwright in his final scene skillfully directs our attention toward the thoughts of destiny and away from thoughts to do with the fact that fortune is none other than the form given by the playwright to the play. There's no way around it. The soothsayer may say that Antony will lose at every game of chance to Caesar, but it is Caesar who has the worst luck 
in this play. He aimed to humiliate Cleopatra in triumph through the streets of Rome. Instead, her Roman virtu outwits and defeats him. She stages her own ceremonial triumph accompanied by her worm. The playwright's design, as Kenneth Burke has explained, imposes dramatic fortune on Caesar. Let's listen one more time. I am fire and air. My other elements I give to baser light. Oh, have you done? Come then, take the last warmth from my lips. Farewell, kind Charmian. Iris, long farewell. But I the aspic in my lips? Dost fall. Thou and nature can so gently part. The stroke of death is as a lover's pinch, which hurts and is desired. Lest thou lie still. If thus thou vanishest, thou tells the world it is not worth leave taking. Dissolve thick cloud and rain, that I may say the gods themselves do weep. This proves me base. If she first meet the curled Antony, he'll make the man the fur and spend that kiss which is my heaven to have. Come, oh. thou um, uh, mortal wretch. It's not intrinsic of life at once untie. Poor venomous fool, be angry and dispatch. Oh, couldst thou speak that I might hear thee call great Caesar ass on policy? Oh, eastern star! To avoid being returned to Rome in humiliating triumph, Cleopatra meets her death by snake bite. The scene, as Julia Cleave tells us, is staged as a hieros gamos, a sacred marriage, and Cleopatra's spouse is the worm. I am. And let's listen once more to what we just heard, because there's a lot in this speech. Cleopatra says, come thou mortal wretch with thy sharp teeth, this knot intrinsicate of life at once untie. Poor venomous fool. She's speaking directly to the worm. Poor venomous fool, be angry and dispatch. Oh, couldst thou speak that I might hear thee call great Caesar ass unpolicied to which Charmian in uh, anticipation of the Christian Annunciation calls out, O Eastern Star. Cleopatra's speech is itself a not intrinsicate for why should the queen of Egypt command a worm to speak, to call out great Caesar, an ass, unpolicied to the rational mind, it is ridiculous, but it does satisfy the conditions for authorial self-reference. The play's most potent expression of Caesar's bad fortune is expressed in the form of Cleopatra's wish for the worm to speak. And this is, if you like, Shakespeare's wormhole in time, activated by his fatal Cleopatra. If you enjoyed this talk, I welcome you to uh, uh, get a hold of a copy of the forthcoming entire talk written by myself and my wife, Shelley Maycock. Uh, which is forthcoming in the fall 2022 Shakespeare in Rome special edition of Critical Survey, uh, edited by Graham Holderness at Hertfordshire University, and with both Stanley Wells and Sir Derek Jacobi, uh, among others, uh, on its editorial board. And in closing, I would just like to give a little plug for my friend Michael Del Hoyt's book, uh, if you want to know more about uh, how wonderful this play is from an Oxfordian point of view, uh, check out um, this uh, uh, wonderful paperback with lots of great notes to which my understanding is greatly indebted. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Roger. That was excellent. Bravo. Lots of kudos from uh, your colleagues in the chat. and. Um, 
just a couple of questions. One was uh, the publisher and the date of the Illusions book. If that's available and you want to share it, that would be great. Um, and then Rick Wagaman also wanted to commend you on all, always uh, citing your fellow Oxfordian scholars. So <laughs> any well, information on the book? Yeah, sorry. There, there, there is. So what's happening is the book is still being typeset, I believe, and we have money we're going to print a, in a limited edition. And this is often done in publishing. Uh, you do all the work and then you mark it again, market it again to the publisher in a very finished product. And so that's what we're doing. And so we don't know either the when or the who yet, but it should be out in a limited edition of maybe 20 copies or so within hopefully shortly. Great, that's so exciting. Well, thank you again for a fascinating talk and thank you for staying on schedule. Bravo. Thank you, Cheryl. <laughs> Uh, our, next, we're going to talk about the annual Shakespeare Who, Who Wrote Shakespeare uh, video contest, which was conceived by the late SOF president, uh, Tom Renier. Uh, he worked with our website editor and today's tech director, Jennifer Newton, to launch the contest. And the mission of the contest is to promote evidence that supports reasonable doubt about who actually wrote the works of Shakespeare and encourage its discussion. Uh, every year we invite submissions of videos up to three minutes in duration addressing this theme, and the winners are chosen by online viewers' votes. Videos should promote reasonable doubt about the traditional attribution of the Shakespeare works in a format that is entertaining, engaging, and witty. There's no fee to enter, no purchase necessary, and the contest is open to residents of the US, Canada, the UK, Ireland, France, Germany, Denmark, Australia, and New Zealand. Um, one must be 18 years old to enter. You can find the complete rules as well as links to this year's finalists and the previous year's winners on our website. Uh, later today, we will announce and screen the top three winners from this year's contest. But right now, I'd like to introduce the winner of the 2020 video contest, The Earl of Oxford's March Remixed by Greg Buse. Enjoy. Well, let me introduce myself. I'm Edward de Vere. You might know me better by the pen name Shakespeare. My people are the oldest British nobles in the mix. We came with Will I Am the Conqueror in 1066. I was maxing and relaxing outside Castle Heading Ham when a couple of things went down with my fam. So I was raised in William Cecil's house. That guy was stiff as wood. Satirized him as Polonius as only I could. Big library and a daughter named Anne, and he was pretty much Elizabeth's Game of Thrones hand. I was married to his daughter, Ophelia, I mean Anne. It was kind of rough and rocky, and before too long I ran to travel Italy and France, knew the languages of courses. That's how I read the untranslated works that were my sources. was in Venice, saw a painting of Adonis, and just like in the poem I wrote, he wore a little bonnet. On my way back home, like Hamlet, set up on by pirates, left me naked on the beach like him, this isn't rocket science. At Gad's Hill, my mates and I robbed the Queen's receivers, just like in Henry IV, part one, and you're still non-believers. The bed trick has now become theatrical cliche, well it was pulled on me and it's in four of my plays. thousand pound annuity from QE1. That's like a million bucks a year today. That's right, son. Didn't have to account for what I did with the money. So let me fill you in, cause it may seem kind of funny. At Fisher's Folly gathered university wits. Mentored Lily Monday Nash and Green, a playwriting blitz. Let a literary movement brought the Renaissance to Britain. Revitalized the language with the plays that I had written. Taught Brits about their history, bolstered national pride. At a time with queen and country under threat from all sides. Wrote the plays and poems and sonnets, didn't even get beheaded. Named be buried where my body is because I don't need no credit. Nothing is truer than truth, which is... Why has he always got a drag ass into it? I don't know, but it's hurtful. It really is.
So as you can see, uh, the the objective of being entertaining and engaging was met by last year's uh, winner, and we're looking forward to the announcement, as I said, of this year's winners uh, later today. Our next speaker is Elizabeth P. Wagaman. Elizabeth has a PhD in medieval French literature and has published articles on William the Conqueror, Edward de Vere, and psychology in the Psychoanalytic Inquiry and Psychology Today online. She is the author of two books, the award-winning children's book, Follow Your Dreams, the story of Alberto Santos Dumont, and Women, Their Names, and the Stories They Tell. She is a member of the New Directions Writing Program of the Washington Baltimore Center for Psychoanalysis, and her interest in the Shakespeare authorship controversy centers on ignored French academic studies of the 19th and 20th century, which address the question. Elizabeth will be speaking today about French academics and Shakespeare. Welcome, Elizabeth. Thank you so much, Cheryl. Why has it taken so long for traditional Shakespeare academics to begin to address the Shakespeare authorship question, while many still adamantly refuse to do so? In 1841, the very popular and highly influential English author Thomas Carlyle published on heroes and hero worship and the heroic in history, which cemented our understanding of Shakespeare in a romantic vision that continues to this day. According to Carlyle's massively popular 1854 book, still in print with Yale University Press, Shakespeare is a monument to Saxondom created by nature, not to be meddled with, whatever that means. This book was a nail in the coffin for English Shakespeare studies, and it elevated Shakespeare to a rel religious cult. Call it worship, call it what you will. Worship means you accept on faith, you do not question. Add to this Roland Barthes' death of the author theory of literary criticism, and you have the perfect storm for ditching historical analysis of literary texts. The current revival of Delia Bacon's 1857 group authorship theory reopens the door to questioning the Shakespeare authorship theory. Unburdened by Carlyle's concept of Shakespeare as an English deity created by nature, French scholars began to question Shakespeare's identity based on a careful historical analysis of the plays, which reveals a complexity impossible for traditional English scholars to acknowledge because it requires knowledge Shakespeare, Shakespeare did not have. In 1918, two years before Looney's Shakespeare identified, Abel Lefranc, an internationally respected Renaissance scholar and member of the Académie Française, published a two-volume study, Sous le masque de William Shakespeare, under the, name, under the mask of William Shakespeare. Although Lefranc's candidate was William Stanley, with some collaboration from Edward de Vere, Looney and Lefant were friends and allies for the case against Shakespeare. Charlton Ogburn mentions both Lefant and Lambin. Lefant observes historical and psychological reasons Shakespeare could not have been Shakespeare. There are no historical records that indicate Shakespeare was a writer. Neither Henslow nor Richard Allen, Shakespeare's theatrical business associates, mention him. When Shakespeare dies, there are no testimonials from his contemporaries. Strangely, we have extensive business records, but not literary records. Shakespeare's business records reveal no travel nor knowledge of any foreign language. Shakespeare does not even have a recognizable signature or spelling for his name, unlike every other writer for whom we have signatures. Lefranc observes that English scholars are guilty of changing the spelling of Shakespeare's name to Shakespeare, which is shameful. Serious psychological incongruities are another problem. 
Unlike what we would expect from a merchant, Shakespeare's works present an aristocratic mindset. The familiarity with which nobles are addressed in the prefaces in Venus and Adonis and Lucrece is absolutely inconceivable for a commoner. The progressive sense of sadness and loss in the plays is contrary to Shakespeare's ever increasing success. Shakespeare's avarice in, in business is in opposition to the moral lessons of the plays. Shakespeare sued for two shillings, put a school friend in debtor's prison and even refused to pay his wife's debt versus the magnanimity of Shakespeare who proclaimed the quality of mercy is not strained. Shakespeare does nothing to stop pirated editions of his works, which was money lost, and he does nothing to secure his works for posterity, which was more money lost, which are business failures incompatible with his penny-pinching record. Curiously, he stops writing at 45. Despite the fact there is no record Shakespeare traveled abroad, travel is a theme throughout Shakespeare's works. To be educated abroad, to see the world, the belief that a man cannot be accomplished without traveling abroad. None of these ideas about travel are compatible with the life of Shakespeare. Shakespeare's plays also reveal a knowledge of French and Italian geography, which are impossible to explain for someone who had not traveled abroad a knowledge so extensive that traditional English academics fail to comprehend how much European geography Shakespeare knew, like the Italian canal system or churches dedicated to St. James in France and Italy, as well as Spain. Shakespeare's works are not censored like those of other authors, with the exception of the deposition scene in Richard II, which was cut. But Shakespeare was never punished for sexual, political, or occult subject matter. How did the sonnets and the rape of Lucrece escape ecclesiastical censorship? Johnson, Chapman, and Nash were all punished for their writings, but not Shakespeare. Regarding the curious timeline of Shakespeare's plays, LeFont believed the plays were rewritten with no explanation as to why we have variant texts unless they were written for presentation at court and then rewritten for the general public, a concept only recently espoused by traditional academics. For most writers of the period, we have records of their education, but none for Shakespeare. Shakespeare's works reveal an astonishing knowledge of music, the arts, heraldry, horsemanship, ancient and modern authors, science, the secret arts, history, the army, marine law, medicine, the French and English court, French and Italian languages and dialects, aristocratic sports like hunting, falconry, tennis, and fencing, and more neologisms based on French than any other English author, according to Le France English contemporary, Sir Sidney Lee. Much Ado About Nothing has a detailed description of a tapestry of Hercules located in Tournai at the time. Musical competitions Musical compositions and the importance of music are found throughout the plays. Shakespeare's knowledge of French, French literary sources, and minor French political figures cannot be explained. Shakespeare did not board with the French Montjoy, Montjoie family, where he supposedly learned French until 1598. But traditional scholars give a 1598 date to Love's Labor's Lost, a play about French nobility in provincial Nérac. Love's Labor's Lost describes details of internal French political deliberations in 1580, for which there was no published record until after Shakespeare's death. Hamlet has a French source for which there was not yet an English translation. Having considered Lefranc's scholastic and psychological observations that prove Shakespeare could not have been Shakespeare, let us examine the historical dimensions of three plays that illustrate Shakespeare was writing with an eye on continental affairs and their importance for England as observed by Lefranc and his protege, Georges Lambin, in his 1962 book, Voyage de Shakespeare, en France et en Italie. 
Their historical lens reveals the amazing complexity of Shakespeare's historical, national, and international vision. Shakespeare followed the medieval allegorical tradition, which sees the world simultaneously in multiple dimensions, the literal, allegorical, historical, typological, moral, and anagogic, spiritual or mystical. Let's consider what traditional scholars have labeled problem plays to see if including the French perspective helps clear up some of the issues for which these plays are criticized. All's well that ends well is the story of Helena and Bertram. Helena manages to win the hand of Bertram by curing the king's illness and by tricking Bertram, beating him at his own game. Bertram finds himself forced to marry Helena if he is to keep his word. Bertram flees to fight for the French king in Italy, a reference to the Italian wars dating from 1494 to 1559, a period of political chaos which consumed Francis I of France, Henry VIII, and the Emperor Charles V. The conflict bankrupted England, France, and the Holy Roman Empire. The war Henry VIII joined with dreams of becoming King of England and France resulted in Queen Elizabeth inheriting the loss of Calais, a loss of English prestige, and an empty treasury. Shakespeare adds another political dimension to that of the Italian wars, with characters Lambin identifies as historical French figures. Spurio, with a scar on his left cheek, refers to both Francois de Guise and Henry de Guise, father and son, both of whom had the same nickname, Scarface, because both had facial scars from war injuries. Francois de Guise, the father, played a major role in the Italian wars, as well as initiating the war between the French Protestants and Catholics. Francois de Guise's son, Henri de Guise, formed the Catholic League, which sought to dethrone the French king, Henry III. Like the name Spurio implies, neither Francois nor Henry de Guise could be trusted. Lodovic represents Henry de Guise's brother, Louis II, Cardinal of Lorraine, who also worked to undermine King Henry III. By adding references to the religious wars in France, Shakespeare suggests that the territorial disputes of the previous generation of Henry VIII have now been supplanted by an even greater danger to England, the religious war between French Protestants and Catholics. Religious differences splitting France into warring factions could also split England just as the Italian wars had split Europe and Italy into warring factions. Lombard identifies many minor historical characters. Shakespeare's Bertram, Count of Roussillon, almost married Maudlin, daughter of Lafou, as Juste Henri, Count of Roussillon, married Madeleine, daughter of La Rochefoucauld in 1583. Helen is a reference to Helen of Tournon, also found in Love's Labor's Lost in Hamlet. Parolis, the braggart soldier, refers to many historical Frenchmen. Spurio, with a scarred face, represents Francois and Henri de Guise. Captain Dumaine represents Charles de Lorraine, Duc de Mayenne, the second Guise brother. Lodovic represents Louis, Cardinal of Lorraine, the third Guise brother, and Vaumont represents the Count of Vaudemont. The farcical language of Parolis captors is based on long duck. How incredible that Shakespeare knew the name of so many small players in unpublished French history. How odd that Shakespeare, who never traveled abroad, thought about parroting the sound of long duck. Lombard's historical insights elucidate the political message of all's well. If society is to survive, fealty to the state must prevail, or society disintegrates, as illustrated by the allusions to the Italian wars and the rebellious French Catholics. 
For an Elizabethan audience, all's well that ends well presented a mirror of the threats they faced, which are the same threats we face today. The danger posed to society when individuals place their group interests above that of the state. However, all's well that ends well considers not only the fealty necessary between the state and society, but also the fealty necessary between the state and the individual. Can the rights of the individual precede those of the state? Bertram finds himself forced to marry Helena in an arranged marriage, which was a lesson Oxford rebelled against, but finally accepted. The audience is left to wonder if all's well that ends well does end well for Bertram and Helena. Will fealty to the state overcome personal interest? Will the flawed hero rise to the occasion? With its imperfect hero and unsettled ending, All's Well That Ends Well is one of Shakespeare's most modern plays. Elizabethan audiences would have associated the image of a sick king with medieval stories of the Fisher King, whose illness is the symbol of a sick nation. Who saves the king? Not his male physicians, but a woman. The Greek name Helena means moon, and the moon is one of the symbols of Queen Elizabeth. Both Helena and Queen Elizabeth have a problematic lineage, a very touchy subject for Queen Elizabeth, which Shakespeare overcomes when Helena saves the king, the symbol of the nation, despite her inferior lineage. Helena saves the king and the country because she has the necessary skill and courage. Helena and Queen Elizabeth are not merely daughters, but replacements for their fathers. And this being Shakespeare, the master of paradox, the clown Lavache brings up associations with Helena Troy, whose suitor causes the fall of her kingdom. Comparing Queen Elizabeth to Helen of Troy is a reminder of the dangers suitors posed for Queen Elizabeth, who could lose her power if she married. According to the popular song of the day, Froggy Went a Courtin', just like Helen of Troy, Queen Elizabeth could be taken off to a foreign country like France if she were to marry. Helena succeeds where the king's most highly regarded men have failed. On an historical and political level, this is a message for Queen Elizabeth's court and those who doubt in her ability to rule as well as a warning about the dangers marriage posed for the queen. To clarify confusion about geography in all's well, Lomba explains, Helena refers to the church of Great Jacques in order to confuse people about where she is going, a plot device which also confused English scholars who mistook Roussillon with the Spanish territory rather than the French city. Another problem play that gains depth when French scholarship is considered is measure for measure, in which Lombay finds a startling number of connections with France. Measure for measure is the story of Vincent, Duke of Milan, Isabella, a novice, and her brother Claudio, who is since sentenced unjustly to death for an illicit liaison with Juliet, his betrothed. Lombay believes that the reference to the dupes, who must either come to agreement with the king of Hungary or attack him, is a veiled reference to the 80, 80 years of war with Spain and the Habsburgs, united against the Dutch, French, and English, a realignment of the European powers after the Italian wars, with England now allied with France. The ruler in the play, the Duke Vincentio, decides to retire briefly from governance and spreads the rumor that he has gone to Poland. Henry III, the French king, went to Poland to serve as the Polish king until he was crowned king of France in 1575. Lambin observes that Henry III's royal lineage dates back to Saint Louis, which explains why Shakespeare has Vincentio choose Ludovico for his name as a friar. Shakespeare also uses the name Louis for the French Dauphin in King John. The opening of the play depicts Vienna as debauched, 
the French court of Henry III was dissolute. Shocking the French, Henry III and his minions broke fashion codes by wearing artificially curled hair, bright colors, strings of pearls, earrings, and quote, velvet bonnets like the whores in the brothels. Lucio says of the Duke, I never heard the absent Duke much detected for women. He was not inclined that way. This remark refers to Henry III's reputation for flagrant homosexuality, unacceptable at the time, and to his failure to have a child. Paradoxically, Henry III was also known for his extreme religiosity, dressing as a monk and flagellating himself, as would his minions. He went on frequent religious retreats. Lambin observes Henry III sought to be a true believer, just as the Duke Vincentio wishes to be a true friar. The city of Vienna is Paris, barely disguised. The Duke represents the French King, Henry III, who was briefly considered as a husband for Queen Elizabeth before his brother, Alençon, became her last suitor in 1579. Lampin discovers links between Isabella's convent and the order of St. Clair, which had a convent at Longchamp in the Bois de Boulogne, where the Paris racetrack now stands. The Longchamp order of St. Clair had mitigated, that is, relaxed rules. Indeed, Isabella says she wishes the rules of her order were stricter. Shakespeare makes the mitigated rules clear when Lucio says, behold, behold, where Madame Mitigation comes, I have purchased as many diseases under her roof with a French crown. The term Madame Mitigation parodies l'histoire des ordres monastiques, the history of monastical orders, which specifies that there are St. Clair monasteries with and without mitigation. Shakespeare mocks not only the debauchery of Paris and its king, but even its nunneries. In 1582, in a story which was not put into print until after Shakespeare's death, Claude Tonnerre was sentenced to death by corrupt Parisian officials for an illicit sexual relationship despite a marriage agreement. Claude was saved by an uprising of Parisians and clerks. After a period of seclusion in the monastery, King Henry III returned to Paris and was informed about the case. Historical names mirrored in the play include not only Claude, Claudio, but Jérôme Angenoust, Angelo, whom Henry III had appointed as his administrator before leaving on his religious retreat, just as in the play. Also, La Roche Flavin, Flavius, Ver, Varius, Saint Luc, Lucio, who slandered the king, as does Lucio, Bernardine, Bernardino, and Ragazzini, Ragazzoni. So that's quite a list of historical characters. Shakespeare also mentions the provost of the prison, who not only guards the prison, but also makes arrests, which was the, only the case in France, not in Vienna or England. Lambin examines Shakespeare's detailed knowledge of the road between Paris and Longchamp, which was only 6.2 miles, as well as discerning slightly disguised names of Henri's minions, a wealth of details that Shakespeare could not possibly have known. Isabella's refusal to, set, to sacrifice her virginity to save her brother mirrors that of the founder of the French order of Saint Clair, Isabelle de France, who refused the king's order to marry because of her vow of chastity. The French Isabelle's surprising resistance to royal authority mirrors that of Shakespeare's heroine Isabella. Both Isabella and Queen Elizabeth define virginity as key to their identity. The emphasis on Queen Elizabeth's virginity became a dominant theme in the 1580s when all hope for Elizabeth's bearing a child was lost. 
What was Shakespeare's message to the queen and her courtly audience? The French court was corrupt. The French king was unstable. France could not be trusted. A sobering message as England found itself allied with the French and the Dutch against the Habsburg, Spain, and Portugal. Isabella's lack of an answer to the Duke's marriage proposal serves as a political message that France was unreliable and a warning that marriage would result in a loss of independence for Queen Elizabeth. The predominance of Italian names in Measure for Measures Vienna suggests the play mirrors Italy's decline, a warning of what can happen to a country when outsiders take over its politics. Shakespeare often uses names of various ethnicities, which are not necessarily related to the location of his plays. His use of ethnically diverse names suggests Shakespeare wanted to create not simply a national perspective, but a European vision and ultimately a universal interpretation for his plays. Love's Labor's Lost. To this day, traditional academics maintain there's no obvious source for Love's Labor's Lost, the play which presents the French court and the battle of wits between male and female courtiers. Lefranc observes the characters are historical members of the French nobility. Navarre represents the king of Navarre. Baron is Charles de Gontu, Baron de Biron. Longueville is Henri de Rien, Duc de Longueville. Dumaine is the Duc de Maine. In addition, the French nobleman to the French nobleman, we also find French vocabulary, La Voix Saint in Bron. Bron was the French dance favored by Marie de Navarre, the queen in the play. The interesting description of Navarre's note writing all along the edges is a trait observed in King Henry of Navarre's historical letters. The Civil War of Wit is a reference to the French religious wars. There is also a reference to Navarre's horsemanship for which he was very famous. There's a peculiar reference to a meeting at the Duke of Alençon's and Marguerite de Valois went to Brabant in 1578 to promote her brother's claim to the throne just before her trip to Nérac. There is a puzzling, puzzling reference to a damsel who died there of a broken heart. And this is a reference to the historical Mademoiselle de Tournon who played a part in Marguerite's entourage in Brabant and actually uh, was rejected by her lover there and uh, died of a broken heart in eight days. And this story was so shocking that it was suppressed and not printed until 1628. The story also appears in Hamlet. Uh, for those who are familiar with the gossip about the French court, it gets even more intriguing. Um, the King of Navarre was known for his constant affairs, not for his vows of celibacy. The queen traveled with a hand group pick, picked group of the most beautiful women at court who were called l'escadron volant or the flying squadron, a military term, because the queen used them to either facilitate or derail negotiations. When they arrived invited or uninvited, the queen insisted that several days be spent socializing before any negotiations could begin in order to put the negotiators in a relaxed frame of mind or the contrary, depending on how the queen felt about the issues. Lefant is even able to identify some of the ladies in waiting. Lost Labor's Lost is not only an accurate rendition of an important diplomatic endeavor the French referred to as la guerre des amoureux, the lover's war, but also a comedy about the French court. The French called the Treaty of Fleeks, which ended the war, La Traité des Amoureux, the Lover's Treaty. When everything fell apart with Marguerite's departure from Nérac, it was indeed Love's Labor's Lost. None of this was published until after Shakespeare's death. The play has been criticized because of its uh, ending with the death of the king. Shakespeare actually telescoped history by less than 10 years to make the questions more dramatic. And they are, what have you done with your life and have you prepared for the next generation? For Queen Elizabeth, the message is brutal. Do not leave England like France without an heir. 
knowing the character's history and ranches, their humanity and our ability to identify with them. Yet again, we see how Shakespeare takes an historical source and adapts it to offer lessons on multiple levels. And in conclusion, um, I think the most important thing I can say here is that the rebirth of the group theory of authorship is an opportunity for Oxfordians that needs to be cultivated carefully. Lefranc believed the plays were written for court and then rewritten for the public. De Vere could have left the reworking of his plays for the general public to members of his coterie of writers. A comparison could be made with the art atelier of the great Renaissance painters. It was the master who did the design, controlled the process, the style, and ultimately the finished work of art. The work of assistance had to match that of the master artist who oversaw everything. The Renaissance was still a time of strict hierarchy and control, as illustrated by its painting workshops. In addition to the rebirth of group authorship theory, which can open doors for Oxfordians, reintroducing, re, reintroducing the French public to Shakespeare's obsession with France could reawaken French interest in Shakespeare, which was lost when traditional English Shakespeare scholars suppressed or ignored French scholarship on Shakespeare. Revealing the importance of French history in the plays and the importance of past French scholarship could bring the French back to Shakespeare. If we invite them in, they could dramatically increase the, the, uh, the impact of the Oxfordian movement. Shakespeare was not merely an entertainer, he was also a political messenger armed with history. In closing, I would like to inform everyone that Frank Lawler is working on an English translation of Le France's first two volumes. Thank you so much. Thank you, Elizabeth. What a fascinating talk and great news that the, a new English translation will be available of Lefranc's work. I, personally, I find your theory, you know, we as Oxfordians, we all believe that the early works were performed at court and then <clears throat> later they were performed for the public. So your, your idea that perhaps that's what his uh, scriptorium was working on is really fascinating. So thank you again. Really uh, enjoyed your talk and any questions we will forward to you. Our next speaker and our final speaker for the first session today is Jim Warren. Jim is a retired diplomat and the 2020 Oxfordian of the Year. He recently published Shakespeare Revolutionized, a history of the first 100 years of the Oxfordian movement. And he's the editor of the centenary edition of J. Thomas Looney's Shakespeare Identified and also of Shakespeare Revealed, a collection of more than 50 of Looney's shorter works. He is also the creator and editor of the Index to Oxfordian Publications and the author of Summer Storm, a novel of ideas in which a professor and his students wrestle with how we know what we know, especially about the authorship of Shakespeare's works. Uh, Jim's talk today is titled The Greatest Deception in Literary History, a con question mark, sorry, a contrarian's view of 1623. Welcome, Jim. All right, well, thank you, Cheryl. All right, today I would like to share with you, and if possible, get your response to some thoughts I've had recently on what has been called the greatest deception in literary history. I now have a new take on what happened in and around 1623, the year that the first folio, the first collection of Shakespeare's plays was published. To back up a bit though, when I was in high school, my best friend and I collected stamps. I always liked this stamp because I liked the color orange and I liked orange juice. Here I thought was a stamp honoring farmers who grew oranges. But one day when looking at it closely, I was startled to realize that the stamp does not say national orange as I had thought, it says national grange. It's honoring all farmers, not orange growers in particular. I was amazed that I could have misunderstood something so easily seen if only I had paid proper attention to the details. That was many decades ago, but I've recently had a similar experience, one related to the issue of Shakespearean authorship, in which I again came to realize that I had misunderstood something because I hadn't paid sufficient attention to details easily seen. 
For centuries, Orthodox scholars have cited three things created in and around 1623 as establishing that William Shakespeare of Stratford-upon-Avon was the writer known as William Shakespeare. These are the prefatory material in the first folio, uh, the monument in Trinity Church, and portraits said to be of Shakespeare. In recent decades, Oxfordian scholars have cited the same three things as evidence of a deception designed to hide the identity of the real author, Edward de Vere, 17th Earl of Oxford. Professor Louis Benezet, president of the American Shakespeare Fellowship in the 1940s, for instance, used the word hoax to describe the actions undertaken in 1623. He used the word in an article published in 1947 titled The Shakespeare Hoax, an Improbable Narrative, and again in 1960 in A Hoax Three Centuries Old that appeared in the American Bar Association Journal. But I have come to believe that the commonly held Stratfordian and Oxfordian views are both incorrect. I disagree with the Stratfordian view that the three steps taken in and around 1623 prove Shakespeare's authorship. And I now disagree with the commonly held Oxfordian view that the steps taken in 1623 were designed to hide Oxford's authorship. On the contrary, I now believe that the steps were taken to reveal his authorship, not hide it. I know that sounds counterintuitive or contrary to the facts or to common sense, so I want to explain how and why I came to hold this new view. First, the how. I recently published two books, Shakespeare Revolutionized, which tells the story of the Oxfordian movement over most of the past century, and Shakespeare Investigated, which reprints the full text of more than 300 articles published by the Shakespeare Fellowship, 1922 to 1936, in the Hackney Spectator and elsewhere. While in the final stages of preparing these books, I came across an intriguing idea, or rather an intriguing question posed in a letter to the Washington Post in 1948 that I didn't have an answer to. I set it aside while finalizing the books. Only after finishing them did I return to it and consider how best it might be answered. The question that was so startling and that got me thinking along new lines was this. If the aim was to conceal that Oxford was Shakespeare, the letter writer wrote, by changing the head and obliterating all identifying details in the Ashburn portrait, why should anyone start with a portrait of Oxford as basis for a Shakespeare forgery in the first place? Think about that for a minute. If the goal had been to hide Oxford's authorship, wouldn't the logical thing to do have been to prepare a portrait of Shakespeare from scratch rather than by altering one of someone else? Why begin with a portrait of Oxford and alter details in it to hide his identity? These are intriguing questions that demand answers. As I began to consider them, I recall that in the early 1930s, the Reverend Charles Sidney Devere Beauclair prepared mock-ups of half a dozen of the best known portraits of Shakespeare. After superimposing them, he demonstrated that they were so similar in all key aspects that they were in fact images of the same person and that that person was Edward de Vere. I also recall that Charles Wisner Burrell had examined three portraits of Shakespeare using X-ray and infrared ray techniques and concluded that all three were portraits of Edward de Vere, two of which had been overpainted to make them more closely resemble the true shot engraving of Shakespeare in the first folio and to hide things in the portraits identifying the sitter as de Vere. I did some comparisons of my own and found that the Ashburn portrait of Edward de Vere is very similar to the Drewshot engraving, even if the resemblance isn't obvious at first glance. If one of the portraits is reversed so that the sitters of both are facing the same direction and the image is resized, the eyes of the two match up exactly, and the size and shape of Oxford's head matches exactly with the mass shown in the Drewshot engraving. Let me demonstrate that. Okay, watch the, um, let's see. Okay, watch the image on the right as I increase the transparency. Okay, there we go. Voila, it's the Ashburn portrait underneath the Drewshout engraving. Now let me reverse the transparency. This time focus on the eyes. You'll see that they never change. They stay the same size and the same distance apart.
Okay, now let me uh, add the transparency again. This time, watch the shape of the head. You'll see that the mask exactly covers the size and shape or matches the size and shape of De Beers' head. So, isn't that amazing that two portraits that look so different from each other at first glance actually are uh, of the same person, or at least appear to be of the same person. And so we're back to the, um, the question, if the aim was to conceal that Oxford was Shakespeare, why start with the portrait of Oxford as basis for a Shakespeare forgery in the first place? The only explanation I could come up with was that the overpaintings had been undertaken to connect the Earl of Oxford with Shakespeare. The alterations had been made not to hide Oxford's authorship, but to reveal it. Let's see if we can understand more completely what was in the minds of those who undertook the three steps of the overpaintings, the prefatory material, and the monument in Trinity Church. We know who was behind these steps, the family and descendants of Edward de Vere. They are identified in the first folio. The incomparable pair of brethren prominently mentioned in the prefatory materials were the Earl of Montgomery, a son-in-law of Edward de Vere, and his brother, the Earl of Pembroke, who had at one time been engaged to another of de Vere's daughters. Let's see if we can reconstruct what was in the minds of these two earls, Oxford's three daughters, and his son, the 18th Earl of Oxford, in the early 1620s. It's safe to say, I think, that Oxford's family sought to preserve the plays by publishing them. The first folio would have a greater chance of surviving than mere manuscripts that existed, perhaps, in only one copy. And it's likely, I think, that the most noble and incomparable pair of brethren sought to promote English nationalism at a crucial moment in English history. As historian and authorship scholar Peter Dixon has shown, the first folio was as much a political statement as it was a literary publication. England at that time was racked by what has become known as the Spanish marriage crisis, in which efforts were underway to marry King James's son, Prince Charles, to a Spanish princess, and thereby create ties between Protestant England and Catholic Spain that many at the time feared would destroy England's Anglican religious and cultural identity. Did they also have the goal of attributing the plays to Edward de Vere? On the surface, the idea seems ludicrous. If they had wanted to attribute the plays to de Vere, doing so would have been easy enough. Simply announce his authorship in the first folio and include in it his image, not the Drushout engraving. But they didn't do that. Does that show that my idea that they wanted to reveal Oxford's authorship is wrong? Not necessarily. For a clue as to what they were really up to, we can turn to Percy Allen, the great Shakespeare scholar from the first quarter century of the Oxfordian era. In discussing Elizabethan drama, Allen wrote of the cunning skill of Elizabethan writers in at once concealing and revealing interesting facts and identities beneath an innocent looking, yet usually penetrable disguise, and the corresponding cleverness of readers and of the elite among theatrical audiences also at penetrating such disguises and perceiving accordingly the inner purport of the text. Perhaps Oxford's family intended with the steps taken in and around 1623 to perpetrate a real life example of the practice of Elizabethan writers of at once concealing and revealing interesting facts and identities beneath an innocent looking yet penetrable disguise. I've come to believe that the cover story of authorship by William Shakespeare was indeed an innocent looking yet penetrable disguise. Here's why. If Oxford's descendants had wanted to create a solid cover story, they could have put into the first folio clear biographical information about Shakespeare, information about his acting and writing career, dedicatory poems by other writers, and Shakespeare's coat of arms. And in the monument in Trinity Church, they could have shown exactly where Shakespeare was buried, included a clear statement that he was a writer, and installed an effigy of a writer, not someone with a sack of grain. But they didn't do any of these things. They provided only the flimsiest of cover stories, one so thin that it invited skepticism. The cover story was so flimsy that it could be strengthened in either direction later. It was strong enough that it could serve as a base for belief in Shakespeare's authorship, 
but it was also weak enough that Shaxford's supposed authorship could be tossed out or explained away later. Now, why would Oxford's family want a cover story instead of a straightforward statement of authorship either way? The answer is that at that time, there were difficulties with making a straightforward statement in support of authorship by either Shaxford or Oxford. Regarding Shaxford, one difficulty was the huh difficulty, the fact that in 1620, nobody thought he was a dramatist. He had never claimed to have written any plays, and there's no evidence that anyone during his lifetime had ever said that he had. Another was the, oh no, he didn't difficulty. Folks in Stratford knew he had not been a famous dramatist. If the attribution to him in 1623 had been too blatant, people in Stratford might have spoken up. And Oxford's authorship was an open secret in literary and court circles. Courtiers remembered that many of Shakespeare's plays had been presented in the court as entertainment created by Oxford long before they appeared on the public stage or were published. They too might have spoken up. So the attribution to Shakespeare had to be done carefully. It had to be significant enough to imply his authorship, but not blatant enough to push those in the know to speak out against it. Attribution to Oxford was blocked by even greater difficulties. One is that he, a senior member of the nobility, had written plays performed on the disreputable public stage and had perhaps even acted in them. All that had perhaps given his name a brand that his family in that class conscious age wanted to erase. Another difficulty is that he had based many characters in part on fellow members of the nobility. It wouldn't do for them to be recognized by the masses. And one way to prevent that from happening was by cutting the connection between the plays and the court, by cutting the connection between the plays and Oxford. Yet another reason could have been that the political events that gave rise to the desire to enhance feelings of English nationalism through publication of the plays also gave rise to political pressures opposed to public recognition of Oxford's authorship. At the peak of the Spanish marriage crisis in the months before the folio was published, the 18th Earl of Oxford was in the tower and Southampton was out of favor at court. Perhaps the most that could be done at that time was publishing the works but withholding attribution to Oxford. The flimsy cover story met the needs of the moment. It enabled the works to be published, but without a clear statement as to who the author was. So we're back to the question of the intentions of Oxford's relatives at the time. Did they intend to further strengthen the cover story in support of Shakespeare's authorship later? Or did they intend to throw it out and declare Oxford the real author? I believe they intended to identify Oxford as the real author at some point in the future, and that the flimsy cover story in 1623 was designed to set the stage for that happening. And the reason for my conclusion is the portraits of Oxford overpainted to hide his identity. We can't get around them. Not only were they overpainted to hide his identity and to make the sitter more closely resemble the Drewshot engraving, they were labeled Shakespeare. I believe that the intention was to bring the portraits forward later and publicly announce Oxford's authorship at a less politically sensitive time. That didn't happen, obviously, because of developments in English history that could not have been foreseen. And the portraits remained listed in inventory records as of Shakespeare in the possession of Oxford's descendants until the 20th century. So there it is, my new belief about what happened in and around 1623. I'd be interested in knowing if you agree, or if not, why not? Thank you very much. Thank you, Jim. Uh, excellent talk, and there were uh, some comments and questions. I'll just um, mention a few. Uh, one person would, is interested in, in Loney's letters to former students and soldiers, so we'll send you the contact information for that uh, person. Uh, Martin Carden asked, does anyone else think that Oxford's right eye shows a strabismus cross eye that is present in his youthful portrait, the older De Vere portrait, and thanks James the Droshit. And uh, Shelley says, Jim, if you can show the transposing the Droshit trick does not work for other faces, Hammersley, for example, because of the Folger's dubious attribution, then you have a very good argument. And she follows that up with so many instances of uh, built-in plausible deniability. And someone else wanted to know, where is the Ashbourne portrait? I know that it was formerly at the Folger. Uh, 
So would you like to uh, respond to any of those or? Um, not really, uh, okay. not at this time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, well. But, but uh, please do email me, you know, if, if you have challenges to this idea, because, you know, it, it seems, you know, at first glance, so counterintuitive and off the wall that I'm not even sure it's right, but, you know, it's, it's, it's my current belief about what happened at that time. Well, uh, you right. know, but I'm open to changing it if, um, you know, new information comes in or new, new perspectives. Great. Well, thank you so much for sharing that, Jim. Really appreciate it. Sure. So as I mentioned earlier today, the SOF is an educational nonprofit organization carrying on a century of scholarship, challenging the traditional attribution of the Shakespeare canon, promoting research and sharing ideas, supporting the claim of Edward de Vere, the 17th Earl of Oxford, as the true author. Um, truly, really, indeed, actually, correctly, genuinely, properly, rightly, in fact, substantially, sincerely, honestly, heartily, and real are the words that pop up if you enter the name Veer, V-E-R-E, -E, in Google Translate. Our researchers know that there are at least as many avenues for scholarly investigation as there are English definitions for the name Veer. And that is why the work of the Shakespeare Oxford Fellowship continues. But we can't do it without your help. We're always looking for help from our members and followers in the form of volunteer hours and donations. If you'd like to volunteer your time to helping the SOF, please visit our website, shakespeareoxfordfellowship.org, and select the About SOF button. To donate, click on the Donate button. Our annual fund drive for 2021 will end on October 15th. So be sure to take advantage of the special thank you gifts. Uh, I'd like to thank all of our speakers today. I hope you enjoyed the first half of our program. There's so much to discover. For me, that's what makes this research so exciting. Um, I wanted to let you know that uh, Shelley Maycock has invited people to a social Zoom after the conclusion of today's conference, that would be at 7.30 p.m. Eastern time. You can email Shelley at smaycock at vt.edu. Um, and I also wanted to mention that uh, Rick Wagaman has uh, provided a link to the 1594 quarto, the sole existing copy of Titus Andronicus, um, which we will share with the uh, attendees because he thinks that we'll be very interested in the digitized version with its um, marginalia. It was discovered in 1904 in the home of a Swedish postal clerk. So thanks for sharing that, Rick. Um, again, the questions and comments will be forwarded to the presenters and, and they'll have the opportunity to answer. Um, basically, at this point, we are going to take a one hour break. We will reconvene at 4 p.m. Eastern time, 1 p.m. Pacific, uh, with our next host, Don, Hugh, Don Rubin, at the helm. And I look forward to seeing all of you then. Thank you again to all of our presenters.